Welcome to this week in wood flutes and duck portraiture. Yeah. With a chill jam. Yeah, so point 2.0 point oh for a new DJ. generation. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing about... spice things up on the show. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, every stand-up comedian on Twitter last night, that was like their January 6th. <laughs> like, the, yeah. there was, yeah. there yeah. was, yeah. there was Brian. no humor. Like, there was just like, they had all been like, like, oh, I don't know, like, uh, Oscar, story of the dog, more like story of my mom. And then this happens and it's like, we all need to understand the grave seriousness that has just befallen our community. That, that was the very dispersion here. Some people are like, oh, people are divided. I'm like, I know one community that's hot. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's a, uh, if, if, if there was one comedian that uh, did a full on Tom and Jerry cha-ching dollar sign moments. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would enjoy this if I didn't like both the people. Oh no! Uh, uh, oh, it's sad. Fact, it's really it, sad. It really exactly. Bummed I'm saying that's really like, bummed we, might, it, it, we wished it was people we didn't like, or if it weren't hardworking people we respected. If I wish it was just a couple of tools, then it'd be like, Aah. yeah. And we're still amused by, it. obviously, the wrong bat, but it was. Well, it's, still, it, uh, it's so it's so bizarre. You can't not react to it, right? Exactly. Like, it's it's so it's yeah. I would be getting a little glee out of it if it was people who are jerks, but like, man, like both those guys worked hard to get where they are. Yep. And just, like just so much respect. Their stories are just inspiring. And you're like, oh, oh. I feel like, I feel like if, if Chris Rock said, oh yeah, I probably, eh, maybe I deserve that. I feel like this, no. this would be, I'm, no. I'm just saying, no, no, just listen. As a comedian, can I oh, finish? Let like, him finish. Let him finish. For you, for you, uh, uh, yeah, it's burn a good, is it's a good thing he can't I'm not run even up say, on stage. You guys I'm not even saying that he should do let this. him finish than I said. All right, time it. Uh, I think if Chris Rock just said, "Yeah, maybe I deserve that," this would be a non-story. <laughs> I think if he was just like, uh, and, "Oh," and maybe. compromise everything he is about a comedian, and th that's a thing. So comedians should apologize. Like that's yeah. that's what they need to do. Is is no. That's not the problem, Bryce. The only reason you're talking about I'm it now is because of the reaction, not because of what he said. Uh, it, okay. Uh, yeah. I, I, okay. I, I was not ready to walk into this into this battlefield. I just. But well, you spoke. Uh, Take those words out of your mouth, Bryce. Well, then I'm not going to apologize for leaving you hanging. Though. Oh, <laughs> that's he does. He's not going to compromise everything that goes into being a podcast host. <laughs> Uh, I although I, I don't think maybe there's no way you can apologize there's, for that no for that joke no. No. no I mean not at this point but I feel like if it was just if, if it if he was on stage like ah 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 if he like laughed it off I, if he was a I, less shocked I, about it, it if, he, if he had just true. been slapped in the face by a <laughs> mega A-lister yeah. an icon of his generation <laughs> yes yeah you're right I, I think I yeah. think if he would have <laughs> maybe re reacted faster to uh, and and not by the way here's the other thing. Uh, that Not moment right after he gets slapped and after the, he, he says the line slap the S out of me right and then he is trying to appeal to him directly with the it was the G.I. Jane joke right after that there is a moment in which his brain which has been honed for decades on how to destroy nightclub hecklers by yelling things that he knows will get a reaction from the audience and that's not <laughs> knowing him personally and not just going on the stuff that is out there publicly about Will and Jada Smith, uh, uh, he stopped himself, and and that is the kindest thing that anyone has ever done for Will Smith in his entire life. Because that, because yeah, that, what he's what he didn't say right after that would have been the most on, epic on t-shirts, yeah. on <laughs> on bumper Will, stickers. How Will Smith, how Will Smith set him up with the line, "Take my wife's name out of your mouth," was like you saw Chris Rock's brain go. Just oh. the Terminator computer of life. Uh, Meryl Barr in the chat does have a point where it's like if if uh, if they hadn't if if Will Smith hadn't shouted very directly showing anger, we would still be musing about whether or not that was a bit, and the world might not have ever known. I, mostly because a it was shot really well, <laughs> and b uh, uh, Will Smith can take a or sorry, uh, 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 Chris Rich? Rock can take a slap. Like, like there was, there was no, uh, uh, he was, he was pretty rigid for a man that just got slapped in the face unexpectedly by a megastar. 
he thought it would be a bit. You could see the moment Will Smith comes up to him. He's like, I guess we're going to do a bit where he's going to pretend to slap me or something. And it'll be funny. And then <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh, you really, really. I thought, yeah, I thought it was going to be like, like maybe like one of those like headlock, like knuckle sandwich, like, oh, you and like, that'd be like some old Hollywood stuff. Uh, but no, that was just a slap in the face. <laughs> he can't do this is the this is the joke he can hit you who are you i'm with stable a star <laughs> Sorry about that. Right. he's allowed to hit you <laughs> no, he's not allowed to hit he's you. not he allowed is, but he's not all right would you like to do a weird thing podcast ready ready let's do yes. it all right i will count you in andrew in three two Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Well, hello, friends. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Howdy, howdy. The, the heat approaches and uh, the withering begins and my AC bill climbs. I am the <laughs> well, Nostradamus well, of <laughs> predicting of summer. This week. <laughs> of the temperature. You're a weatherman. A man who may bend with the wind but not wither. You're not even like a right. studied it's meteorologist. Too. You just like know what the clouds look like. How great, how great would the local weatherman be if he only spoke in quartets? <laughs> or like, like the, the Star Trek The Next Generation, you know, like Fallis and the retreats yeah. of such and such. Yes. Only in references. <laughs> yeah. That was, there was a funny meme. That was, there was a Star Trek Next Generation episode where Picard has to learn how to talk to an alien who can only speak in metaphors, which seems neat, but they now say like, man, you have to know that entire cultural history to understand those metaphors. And they took the gif of like, he's like, oh, when, you know, such and such did this. And he's like, oh, you know, when, uh, you know, and he responds like, oh, when the intense, you know, when the ants attacked, you know, Saruman, <laughs> And you're like, oh, you know, like, oh, you know, we get it. All I need to do is just like Lord of the Rings references and everything would be totally understandable. I mean, that's shockingly close to the reality we have now with meme culture. It was really wild because that that was an out there device in the early 90s. By the way, hi, Bryce. How are you? Hi. Hi, Bryce. <laughs> I did also... introduce Bryce. You talked right over. Yeah, by the way. I believe. Exactly. I, 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 uh, 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 Brian, speaking. I will. Andrew. I will not apologize. <laughs> Hello. I'm I said, the Miami. I said, heat. when you're doing your weather analogy, I go, man, who may bend with the wind, but not wither as Mr. Bryce Castillo, but you're too to be there talking. There we go. I'm sorry. I'm the, the, holding uh, strong uh, through this segment of the show. To, Hello. to, to anybody who <laughs> hadn't seen it, like in the early 90s, uh, uh, you know, data says it's the equivalent of understanding the grammar of a language but lacking the vocabulary. And that was a interesting, wild problem for them to solve using universal translators in Star Trek. And now it's literally the way I talk to my teenage daughters, where it's like, I understand the grammar and syntax of meme culture, but I lack the vocabulary of what references they're making. Yeah. Well, like, uh, uh, during, during the race this weekend, like something very funny happened and on Reddit, everyone said the same exact thing in response. It was like a, an arrested development meme. And like, we all had the exact same first thought, which was this 20 year old show, uh, and and it was very funny. What's, I, it's I, one, I, at I, one point, Michael, over. what could it cost? Wait, wait, wait. So your point <laughs> was, I used the... a meme this week. <laughs> yes. So, okay. No, I just no, want to make sure that it wasn't a commentary so, on what we were saying. <laughs> Rather, you just a wanted a to point out just, that you made a meme. And it just says, I used a meme this week. Yeah. I'm just I'm just very very glad that you were able to bring up F1 again because that's something that's so rare for you to bring up the fact that you're into F1 racing. The point is yeah. that, that everybody at the same time don't apologize, Brad. Had, had that had that. It's like <laughs> remember when they they announced uh, uh, President Obama's national portrait, Justin. Of remember course, they, they, they yes. with the, the flowers. Portrait. Yeah, literally at the same time, we sent each other the same exact Simpsons gif of yes. Homer backing into the bushes. <laughs> it was literally <laughs> blink, blink. They yeah. just popped up at the same time. <laughs> and so the rice, rice. It's not just that we use this way to talk. We think the same means, exactly. you know, in the, the yeah. timing. So, it and is, that's what I was trying to say. Exactly. <laughs> Talk about I, agree with you. I, yes. I, I heard you, Bryce. Yeah. I heard you. We've all used memes, <laughs> and, and no one should think different. Uh, <laughs> Just in case, I'm tired of these rumors <laughs> Just that, that I don't use memes, that Bryce doesn't use. <laughs> Bryce uses Bryce, memes all the I, time. If, if I could stop him, I it's would. But, you know, Michael, he's so fast at using memes, fast as an F1 car. <laughs> 
He's the Max Verstappen of memes. Oh my God. Meme Verstappen. Oh my God. I'm, no, I'm shocked he got a name. <laughs> he got a name. Right? It, it, it's not on the screen, I don't believe. No. He, wow. <laughs> Bryce, you know he does research for his. Insults. I know, he I know, stuff off. exactly. Like, I, I, I got I have to get Bryce with an F one thing, and I got to do a little F one research. Like Bryce, like, honey, got to like, no, this may come up, and I need to have a reference that I can make. So it looks no, like I know look, I know a lot about F one because people tweet about it a lot, which I take as God's retribution for me ever tweeting about wrestling. That's <laughs> like, like now yeah. that's that's my thing that is my omnipresent. Curse for you is empathy yeah <laughs> you now realize what it's like about no, I know. every third week of the year exactly and now it's you know every week everyone's <laughs> like oh the the poll took the thing no, I'm just, all right, that's awful. <laughs> oh, yeah, don't keep going. Uh, no, I'm what not. No, that's hack. That's terrible. I, I apologize. No, I don't apologize. <laughs> that goes against everything that a podcaster stands for. I'm not apologizing. Ser Sergio Perez comes in and slaps you across the face on live TV. <laughs> That's another racer guy. But he just it barely phases you, though. You're sort of like, uh, yeah, okay. but, is that uh, a bit? I don't, I don't know. Mm. Uh, so, uh, gentlemen, um, <laughs> I want to talk about the Russian invasion. Good. Oh my God. I'm glad that we're. I'm oh, glad. Venus 50 years ago. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 oh. He did it. He did, he did it. it. 50 years ago, <laughs> Russia, then the Soviet Union, landed a probe on Venus and it was able to last for a total of 50 minutes, which. Um, oh, I'm sorry. 5 5 0? I thought it was less than that. Um, let's check the lunch. I guess, I, I, and, and keep in mind, I'm drawing on uh, 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 grade school education the, where uh, I thought it melted like within Brian. five seconds. No, 50 minutes and 11 seconds. Oh, damn. Uh, that rounds so, uh, up to an hour. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, it does, Justin. Yes. It does. Yeah, I also use know. clocks. <laughs> If you, if you read if you if you read science fiction and books from like the 30s and 40s, the idea that maybe Venus was like going to be like this tropical version of a fully tropical version of Earth with dinosaurs and anything like this, and the, and the cloud cover was just keeping them warm, just going to be nice and cozy. <laughs> then we realized that like it's an acidic atmosphere, rains of acid, the surface is super extremely hot, hotter than Mercury, is basically hell, and. The uh, Russians back then, like they weren't afraid. Like, yeah, we'll send a probe there. We're like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna try Mars. We're gonna do that. Mars is kind of like Canada to us. So, like, well, and uh, in in that weird, you know, space race era, it makes sense to you know possibly. Uh, I, I would assume with spectroscopy, uh, spec, spectro spectroscopy, mm -hmm. they they would probably have an idea of what the atmosphere was made of. Um, but man, I love those old Ray Bradbury stories of representing it as a lush jungle environment, which you could almost buy. It's, it, it's exactly uh, Earth-sized, uh, constant cloud cover, so maybe it's reflecting a bunch of sunlight, and so it's not that hot or mm -hmm. whatever. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the hellscape uh, was there. But, but imagine an alternate universe where basically the U.S. claims Mars and the Soviet Union claims a, ru a, a lush uh, uh, jungle uh, Venus. Hmm. It seems like we would get the bad end, the short end of the stick on that one. I'm sure that's what they were hoping and, that and they could off report brand. to the citizenry. Oh, and yeah. off brand, because they should get the red planet. <laughs> that's, that's right. It's their whole thing. It's, it is true. It's their whole thing. Yeah, oh, one of the, we one should of the secure it and trade it. <laughs> yeah, one of the reasons they may have chose Venus was that uh, easier to sort of get there, a payload there than to Mars because mm. of the distance. But, but still, it needs, they did it. And I read... a. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, there's a bread book that was by R.C. Clark, written shortly after sort of the start of the space race, and he was talking about why did the Russians kind of leapfrog ahead of us? And it kind of came down to the talk, the idea of ballistic missiles, like in was belittled right around World War II. The idea, the problem was, is they're looking at V two rockets and saying, you know, great, you have this rocket, but you only can put a payload of a few hundred pounds. That's not very practical. And then we built the first atomic bomb, which weighed tons. And they're like, yeah, it's not practical. You'd need a rocket that was, oh, I don't know, like, you know, able, you know, 200 ton rocket to be able to send something like this to another, you know, to land this on another continent. 
And we're like, yeah, so let's not pursue it. And the Russians were like, 200 ton rocket? Okay. And so they started building these massive heavy rockets while we were building smaller ones because the military didn't think there was a practical use for delivering warheads. Well, so the Russians were like, well, these. Oh, I, I, sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, but it does occur to me that um, one thing the Soviet Union was always good at is if it did not require a fundamental scientific advancement or an engineering breakthrough, but, uh, but maybe had the negative downside of being incredibly wasteful and just done on a very large scale, their system was pretty well built for that. Well, I, but I would say that their, their metallurgy – like their, their, their metallurgical sciences were ahead of ours in many ways. And, and their engineering, if you go look at the engineering they did, the Russian engines are still among the best in the world, the quality. And so their engineers, if they could take, they, and to your point, they weren't going to, let's say necessarily, it was an environment where it was going to be easy to create some new exotic sort of thing, but to take a thing of like, to have some people who could work with you, they were very good because you could assembly line metallurgical materials because you could have 30 people working and trying to figure out what alloys of nickel and whatever to do. But like their Korolev and their early rocket scientists, the best, among the best that have ever lived. But it was still like when you got into more complex systems, that was hard because like the Russians had built their, their massive, after he passed away, they tried to build their big, huge, massive rocket that had like, you had like 30 separate engines and they were using the combustive fuels that could kill people. like that those complex systems like yeah it fell apart because they just you know, you know that that there. was that was at the center of the famous kitchen debate uh, in 1959 with uh, Richard Nixon and Khrushchev where there was like a cultural exchange thing that uh, it was a a the, the the showing off of the United States kitchen the the American kitchen and uh, uh Nixon is there Khrushchev very arrogant uh, as as he was comes in and uh talks about how this is the example of the difference between the soviet union and america that america wants you to buy a new microwave every three years they want you to buy a new house every every four years and that the soviet union this is why we are better is that we build these things to last like this is this is the great pride of the soviet union you buy one house you live in it your entire life and your kids live in it uh, uh, afterward but it was it was a fundamental uh, the idea of built to last uh, versus let's upgrade you know uh, make it more disposable it, it was, was a fundamental thing it, to their uh, to their culture to their ideology but not the reality those things most no. a lot of the stuff just no. did as it <laughs> as, 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 like as, as it, uh, yeah as it as it turned out some people want a different microwave no matter how well built it is and and well, especially they wanted, if they don't they wanted a they wanted yeah. a microwave. They didn't have them. They they just, yeah. There was no such thing as consumer microwave really in Russia because they couldn't manufacture that. And they would some some stuff like certain Russian trucks, that certain things were built like you look the Soyuz. That thing is built and designed is probably as well as you can take something from what we knew how to do in the 1960s and get this thing to like where it does every system correct is probably as efficient as it needs to be and redundant in the way that it is. They're very good at a lot of things like that. Mm -hmm. am, am I, and it, it occurs to me that both you, Andrew, and Justin probably can correct me on this, but the imp I'm half remembering a story of why the Soviets were so good at mathematics. And, and I seem to remember that uh, the Soviet system uh, relied on a lot of um, talking and careful language. And in mathematics, you didn't have to engage in any of that. So it attracted a particular type of skilled talent to it. Uh, whereas like even agriculture, you have a, a Lysenkoism where, you know, they're, they're, they're saying like, uh, American agriculture is BS. Uh, this is the way it is. We, uh, forget your Punnett squares. Yeah. I think that's one of the factors, absolutely, is that that because there were prior, but prior to the Soviet Union, you still had some some very amazing Russian mathematicians that made some interesting things, and a lot. In fact, in fact, like space science too, and you know, and things have come from there. But absolutely true that it was harder to politicize economics. You could politicize math was harder to politicize. Chess chess was one of these games in the Soviet Union that was cheap and people could play and you could play chess and it was not political. Somebody could win a chess, you could have a chess ranking, you could have, you could have chess clubs, etc. Chess, people who were good at chess tend to have an inclined towards mathematics. And it was, didn't cost anything. To be a mathematical researcher versus in the absence of computers, it's not the same as if you're trying to do cutting edge research into alloys or semiconductors or things like this.
And, yeah. You know, you, you, to this day, like, okay. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, uh, you know, what doesn't require cutting edge research is the decision to support this show. Sure, man. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you need to go. If you want to keep this show on the air each and every week, we come on here and talk about news of the weird. And sometimes I... I, I make fun of Bryson and I regret it. <laughs> no. I regret it. I regret it, but I won't I we won't apologize. And, and I will not circles. apologize, but oh, internally okay. I regret it. This is like a monologue. A car. This is a monologue that I'm making you made that, not me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 so head on over there, patreon.com slash weird things. Uh, uh, not only do you get the satisfaction of keeping the show in the air, but you also get the after things podcast before anybody else, where we spill the beans on all the projects and numbers and strategies that we use to be creative professional so head on over there right now patreon.com slash weird things on uh the subject of like russian mathematics um there was the russian mathematician i'm gonna try to pronounce his name right uh Tchaikovsky. he came up with a series of equations describing how rockets could work and this was published in 1903 1903 is when we know and you know einstein published you know general relativity but also was when he published these equations what's fascinating is that for years still people would advocate like oh using rockets to travel in space and their learned phds like the royal astronomer and people who are super bright were like no that won't work you, you can't you can't do that because uh you need to have something to push off of basic physics and people who are trying to promote the idea of rocketry were just sort of shouted down in some places by educated people finally you know the rocket started to work and when people talk about you'll hear that like oh well scientists say it can't be you know Arthur C. Clarke's the one who said that like you know when a scientist an elderly scientist says something's possible he's probably right it's impossible he might be wrong but you'll hear people say, oh, that's not possible, whatever. And, but, and they're like, well, yeah, but they turned, this turned out to be true. In the case of rockets, as you could say, well, no, here are these equations. Here's the guy that actually ran the math. And no, it is, it is real. That person who said this does it. And when people talk about things like fast and light or whatever, and people go, oh, it's not possible. And people go, oh, well, they said that. Like, maybe, but it's all like, we don't really have those equations. We have equations that say that inside relativity, maybe this could happen or whatever. And I think, I think that's often you find out a thing that somebody says wasn't possible. It, there was an entire body that said, yeah, no, the math works out. But other people were saying, yeah, but it's, you know, reusable rockets was another example. Like, oh, not possible. You're talking about a reusable rocket. Like, well, the math works out. Yeah, but no, you know, man flight. That was the thing where they're saying, no, yeah, you, you're not going to be able to have, you know, heavier than air aircraft. That's an impossibility. Like, well, well birds and <laughs> math. No, sorry, it can't be done. Yeah. And, like and they were right. You know what is uh what what what's the idea that technology increases at, at an exponential rate, like it we it, it kind of has to when we keep kind of breaking through frontiers of technological advancements, right? As things get more miniaturized or use less power or more power efficient or have what have you, um, it, it we have to keep inventing things beyond our imagination of what is you know. Really yeah. feasible to uh, a fun book is Arthur C. Clarke's Profiles of the Future. He wrote this in 1962 and then he updated it again at like 1999. Um, and he left everything in there, including he has an entire chapter talking about ground effect vehicles, effectively hovercraft, and how they were going to probably become the predominant form of transportation on land. <laughs> you know, and like, because they're like, oh, hovercrafts are this are great, blah, blah, blah. And be like, think this is what they can do because you don't need to have a port, you can just go across an ocean up on land you know roads you don't have to maintain your roads you just all in on hovercrafts and then in the 1999 update he's like uh yeah i was a bit off on that and he says i actually when i was i had uh when he's like an indonesian a sri lanka he says i actually had a hovercraft imported for my personal use for me to use and i tried to drive i drove it up on a beach ripped apart the shirt the skirt and it stranded it on the beach and he goes that was the last time i drove anything <laughs> wow. So that was it. He was all in on hovercraft, and he's like, well, this is terrible. And that was it. <laughs> and we, we, he realized you can't control him. He says, there's no way you take it down a street because he didn't realize the factory and you can't steer. They're really, they just, because they just, you know, they're going to go wherever they're going to go. He realized how hard they are to control and all the other difficulties there. And he's like, there's some, some places where they're useful, but he says, oh, yeah, no, this is the way I envisioned these things. Like, I didn't factor in that they were basically how, like how fan inefficient boats. they were. Yeah. Yeah, they were basically then, uh, the uh, hot air balloons that you had a fan on the back of. 
<laughs> that you can just yeah. sort of vaguely direct yourself. Mm-hmm. And it just the fact that 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 what I read, I'm like, that's an amazing story. I've never heard before. The Arthur C. Clarke's like like the last time he ever tried to drive anything was to you know to see for himself how good of a hover hovercraft was for personal transportation. <laughs> And they, uh, meanwhile, um, where, where are we at if we're going to wildly speculate on, you know, we, we, we love reporting on the latest crazy quadcopter, the latest Green Goblin glider or whatever. Um, do, do we think there's much there or, uh, or because by virtue of being electric, they are going to be energy efficient. However, by virtue of being electric, they can fall from the sky. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, how optimistic are you about the quadcopter rev- revolution? Uh, I mean, I, me personally, I, I think that if, if we're worried about the reliability, then, I mean, you could, you could predict with, you can predict with like kind of battery technology where you're going to get at a power density, where you're going to be happy with it. And I, I think that for practical commercial use, I'm just spitballing here, but I think we're eight to ten years away before you're really going to be happy with the practice. The battery, the bat for suburban utility going point to point in city, the, the battery density is going to probably be good enough for being able to build a craft like that. So if we say that, and the question is the safety factor of the thing failing, then you're going to need to add if if it's if there's reliability, then you need to add in what's going to be the extra weight of of, of, a, of a really good safety system. And parachutes aren't the only one. Or inflatable bag. There's, you know, we, we now, you look at being suit technology, we know a lot more now about how to design systems that capture air and, you know, things that slow you down. And so I think that, you know, that might be a next step is where we have like, because like you can, you can parachute have like pants. parachutes attached. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Whoa. Do, um, do, do, do you think that, because to me, the first thing I think of is we'll never get past the noise. They're just so loud. Any, mm-hmm. Anything that flies like that. Uh, but you know, then again, you know, we uh, went to uh, uh, Miami and, and experienced an outdoor park that had a bunch of noise canceling speakers that that oh. canceled out traffic noise so that people could sit in the park and listen to an orchestra. I mean, yeah, I think that your you, you, your point your point about noise is very. Yeah, that's very key because I, I remember I, I was having lunch with somebody in like, down Beverly Hills or somebody. He's a, he was a bit of a futurist guy and he was talking about how Elon Musk was dumb to try to build you know, the Hyperloop tunnels. And I'm like, I don't know, but I'm like, I certainly see an advantage to having really efficient tunneling technology because the all the extra space that you create commercially. And I hadn't thought about it, but he's like, oh, but flying cars. I'm like, cool. Count all the cars around here. Now think of the average sound, as you pointed out, and now imagine that they're flying directly overhead. How loud is that going to be? And, and he'd never even thought about the sound levels. I said, you're, we're used to listening to one. Imagine 40 or 50 in a one-mile radius, and it's ridiculous. But like you said, we might use back to the future style flying car corridors using noise-canceling things. That might be the way that you say, okay, you know, we, to, in the areas we get. Because, like, we do have that. There may be, I've speculated, there may be a – a black hole in certain patent applying uh, applications for we when we sent in the helicopter to helicopters to go kill Osama bin Laden um, part of the, the loss was they had special blades that were designed to lower the sound not dramatically but mm. that's that's a very big area of stealth technology is lowering the sound that propellers give off and like shapes and things like this so there might be a lot of technology that we already have that could mitigate that, but it's just sitting somewhere in some filing cabinet or it's on some military base. Uh, that's one of those things. When I think back to my childhood memories, uh, I, I grew up in Huntington Beach uh, until the age of five or six. And when I think back to those memories, one of the things I, I remember vividly is the sound of, of planes going overhead. And then at some point, I just stopped ever hearing planes going overhead. And then we bought this seven acres and there's, it's a, it's a valley that goes down 150 feet. And down at the bottom of the valley, I noticed, oh wow, I'm hearing a lot of planes for the first time in forever. And I just, it, it never, I never paused to consider how much of my life I spend either indoors, insulated from you know uh, outdoor sounds or just hearing traffic constantly at all times where you're not gonna hear any planes. And crazy thing to think about how geography affects landscape in Scandinavia, where you have fjords and you have places like that, you have yodeling. 
And in places that are flatter plains, like uh, the American plains in Africa, you have drums. Oh, that's wild. Yeah, because different, uh, uh, you know. High pitch versus low pitch. Yeah, exactly, are going to travel differently. Oh, wow. So. Noise, man. It's a real thing. What's up with these noise? Anyway, yeah. Elon Musk got COVID. <laughs> he did? He, did? <laughs> he loves yeah. it. Yeah. He didn't already have it? I think he said he had it again. Oh, yeah. Wow. But this time he had no yeah. symptoms. Who knows, man? I know. Everyone's out here getting this COVID. What's up with that? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> We're still doing it's, that. Uh, yeah. Uh, are we still uh, doing COVID? Uh, 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 yeah, back in the 80s, COVID be driving like this. <laughs> <laughs> although, uh, although I did, uh, I was I was a bit shocked. Uh, it, it was either 1 in 12, I think it was 1 in 16 uh, Britons in the UK just have, have the new strain of COVID, super, super infectious, so it is. What was my prediction? Your prediction was COVID that COVID exists. Cool. We make a Everybody gets COVID this year. That yeah. was my 2022. Everybody's going to get COVID. It's Omicron. Like that, that's the thing. We, we shared something with, uh, since last Monday, which was countries that were doing lockdown strategies. Uh, and again, I mean, everybody's got to figure out their own sort of strategy. In the beginning, you know, Sweden looked like that was working really well. Like, and then like, remember this term, everybody? Herd immunity? Yeah, herd yeah. immunity kind of. Uh, turns out it's hurt. Yeah. Abusing. Yeah, yeah, Brian, how did that previous <laughs> dose of COVID help you with the next dose of COVID? You could have just, you could have just, nice no, single. he wanted to go for it all and <laughs> got none of it. Uh, 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 yeah, it, it, there was actually a really good, uh, I think it was in the New Yorker, uh, but an article about two things. Number one, the kind of graveyard of uh, uh, different metrics for which we have chased, uh, uh, and some of them get retired and some of them just get memory hold and some of them go away and then come back of like what's good what's bad herd immunity is one of them that has totally fallen down the the, the memory hole of like well if we can get x amount of people vaccinated or or they have natural immunity then that would uh, uh, have a have a factor but the the meat of the article was trying to and there's a few places that are tracking this just tracking solely excess deaths uh country by country and trying to see whether or not there's any different factors there uh, because while those stats may or may not be perfect, they are at least not variable based on testing regimes or things like that. And so, uh, and that's fascinating to, to look at because as it stands now in terms of COVID deaths, if you look at it on, on any of the, the publicly available stuff, the United States has far and away the, the most, but in excess deaths, we're somewhere around like 47th or, or, or 48th um, from when the, the, the onset to it. So, And excess deaths will also include um, uh, stuff that either, depending on how you squint, uh, is totally un-COVID related or COVID related. For example, um, uh, uh, Justin sent me an article saying that alcohol related deaths for people under 65 up 25%. More people under sixty-five died from booze-related things than COVID. In in the first year, yeah. In 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 in, 2020. in in the lockdown year, yeah. Yeah, in in the big lockdown year, yeah. More people. It was slightly more, but it was more uh, uh, than than had officially died of of COVID under sixty-five. So there was a new report that came out that was trying to look at Sweden's strategy because Sweden's strategy initially seemed like we'll just go to COVID, we'll go to herd immunity, whatnot, see so where it goes. And a lot of people said, well, that's the way to go and that's the way to do. And then it turned out to, they now have like a way higher mortality rate than other places compared to countries. And somebody did a report like what went wrong. And it basically was, they basically chose one camp who to believe for all the stuff. And then yeah. that was it. Instead of continuously, they said, well, these people seem to know what's going on. They're going to be our experts throughout this pandemic, rather than let's bring in multiple voices, credible scientific voices, and keep assessing as we go. And I think that needs to be probably the strategy of everyone. You're not always going to, they're not always going to consensus give you the best point of view on this. Somebody, you know, one extreme point might be right one out of five times and look like they're extremely right or whatever. The, the, the herd immunity seemed like a good idea when we thought the rate of mutation would be such that, you know, it wasn't going to mutate out of this. And that, 
that's <laughs> where it wasn't going to mutate on 19 different proteins at once. <laughs> like, it, yes, uh, there, there's an article today Which, in the New York Times that uh, it's an opinion piece about just sort of guesstimating where stuff's headed. And and they uh, they have this graphic representation of of just like, you know, you get one mutation here, one mutation there. And then it's like and then here's uh, Omicron and it's just all these red spikes up at once and it's like and and it's probably not going to stop there and that's the i'm going to bring it back because it is the most important scientific question of our century which is the zoonotic or lab leak hypothesis and to people there are people with phds who say what does it matter what difference does and i understand if you're not don't get the science don't know to think what why do we need to lay blame it's not really Imagine a computer virus was tearing apart computer systems and we still weren't able to stop it. And somebody's like, would you like to talk to the person who made it and see their source code? And you go, does it matter? Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, uh, real quick, going back to the idea of everybody lumping in with one kind of school of thought. Uh, a thing that, that I was thinking about this weekend is that there really seemed to be a merging of two camps that I felt that I feel especially more so now needed to have a, a line of delineation to it. And that is scientific consensus for which is chaotic and always evolving. And there are no sacred cows and things that we thought yesterday can be untrue tomorrow. If the right things are presented and then separately public health officials, because public health officials, their job is very different than the scientific community. And I feel like that kind of became one, especially during the first few uh, uh, years of the pandemic, because the public health official, and look, it's an important job, but their goal is to make a call on something and then and it better be work so with their populace. Simple. Everybody that, can follow Exactly. It. They have to make decisions. They have to, like, their job is not to f quote unquote follow the science. The scientific consensus should be to follow the science. Their job is to pick the thing that they believe will help the people the most and make it as clear and transparent as possible while hopefully keeping a, a, a line of dialogue and trust between the people that they are governing. And I think the, the, the combining of those two, follow the science, here are the scientists. The scientists are public health experts. They're not, they should be two different well, things. Hold up, let's say for vaccines, the FDA has their decision group and they had a panel of advisors. They oh, went no. To. oh no, oh <laughs> no. So you're saying they should follow if the advisors are like, hey, no, we really shouldn't do this, whatever. And there's maybe a majority or it was nowhere clear as that, that the FDA should probably be inclined to follow that decision because that's the scary situation we're in is where hey man from my is what stupid is it, understanding of things, what does it matter what kind of government mess got us in this <laughs> well, it's like well we're gonna get a group of people together and we're gonna they say well we don't like what they said you chose these people yeah you chose them you know, yeah. like, like what's did alex jones sneak in there like what happened like like no and, and it's like i don't I agree. I think that I totally agree. That's the problem is that often we'll be like, well, this person said this, they're a PhD. Yes, that person has been an administrator for 30 years and his name may be involved in research, but he's never touched a pipette. They've always been the person that gets the grants and stuff. And their job is to bring money. Their job is to bring money to the facility they work for. That is entirely it. If they don't do that, they don't, they don't progress. If they do it really well, and that may be Hey, we had a problem. How can we mitigate? How can we get rid of this problem as quickly as we can within the letter of the law or not get in trouble, whatever? How do I get more money for this? I don't care really about the implications because I'll be gone. It's the same agreed that you have in corporate America. Or uh, when, when, socialist. One last footnote that that just sticks in the back of my mind is uh, uh, just remembering that the uh, evolutionary pressure on a disease um, is to become more contagious. Uh, there, there is a temptation to link that with be less lethal, but there's no reason to necessarily expect that to be the case, which, uh, if, if you're sleeping too well, here's a, hi, I'm Brian Brushwood. Are you sleeping too much? Are you oh, sleeping through I, the whole I'm, night? I'm sleeping eight, 18 hours a day. <laughs> Let me just uh, remind you that, uh. Uh, at any given point, something could be very contagious and get even more contagious and also become it, very deadly. <laughs> it's like the invisible hand now. is that people make the assumption like invisible hand, I'm not capitalism, I'm not as a work like, well, you got to look at the time frame. Over time, yes, 
If Ebola gets 30 years in a population of 10 trillion humans to a fall through, by the end of it, Ebola will be pretty inert yeah. and we'll be yeah. fine uh, with it. Ebola's last thought will be, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But meanwhile, but, all but the humans will be it, dead. <laughs> but if we give it enough people, eventually, but we may run out of people before the virus has a chance to yeah. mutate to something. It's math. It's like, yeah, like, oh, like with like Omicron, I'm like, yeah, like you said, like, Nine different places of the protein could, you know, change. Like, man, you know, I, know, I wanted to design a thing. Uh, 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 I, I'm, we've talked about it before, but it's really astonishing. I, I, I spent a good like six months. Uh, my on an, an airplane uh, mobile game to play was Plague LLC, uh, where basically you play as the disease trying to infect all of humanity and eventually kill them all. And there really are two phases. You want to be very infectious early on, but not lethal. But exactly, and then you use your power ups to become, you know, sneezable or or infectious surfaces, or and then every so often you have to have something like nausea or whatever. And then, but eventually, them them tricky humans start going to work trying to figure out how to vaccinate against you. But I mean, the toughest thing is to get into Iceland. You've got to get into Iceland as fast as you can. It's all Iceland. And Madagascar. Uh, yes, exactly. Okay, yes, exactly. But I'm really astonished at how those lessons became intuitive. And and uh, I was going to say, like, uh, did, uh, everything y'all you, were saying was like, yeah, I've played Play Inc. I know. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> first you get more contagious, and then you get more lethal. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, uh, th that would be what well, kind of a segue, too. Uh, I want a little bit of self promotion um, and talk about something which is, I think games and learning through games is an amazing way to sort of, we've, we've been building games for the entirety of human history to learn stuff. You know, puppies will play with objects and play with, they'll invent little games and push it over here, do this. We like the idea of simulating a thing to understand something because it lets our nervous system learn all these different outcomes. If I do this, what happens if I do that? If I do this and observing something's one stage of that, but then experimentation and say, well, if I do that. So gameplay, I think is essential. Uh, uh, OpenAI, of which I work, so disclosure there, and I'm the science communicator for, among other things. Um, one of the things we just announced is we had a year ago, we announced a model called uh, Codex, which is able to generate computer code. You give a comment, it produces code. And that got built into a tool into VS Code, which is a Microsoft tool for working on like, you know, coding. and. It has become extremely popular. It is like a tremendous amount of code that's put, we've talked about this, it's being code generated, it's now using a computer to assist it. We unveiled a couple of weeks ago, a new model that's been a little bit improved, some little tweaks here and there. And I played with it extensively because I was very curious to see how well natural language could create code entirely. Could you build entire applications through natural language? Could you just give it a series of instructions using this new model and have it build something? And so I spent uh, you know, a couple of weeks just playing around experimenting. I put up a blog post and found out that like the new model, like I was able to build a minimal version of Legend of Zelda where you controlled the character and moved around. And each time you moved off screen, it created a new screen for you. I could have replaced it with sprites of, of objects, but I just wanted to keep it as simple and everything, everything was done in JavaScript. I figured out how to make a version of Wordle using this holy cow with wow. you know and that was the I, if you link to it on the on my website i have i link to code pens where you can see the actual that but you'll see the uh you see the instructions that i gave it and so i just say i gave it a word list i say letter inputs and so those are the instructions oh, wow it's uh, even can, still can, in the javascript uh, if, if, if you don't mind can can i read some of this for the audio listeners like yeah, like this is the instructions literally literally say one secret word Create a function to generate a secret word from this list. Apple, Bible, drink, earth, fable, there's a few more. Select a secret word. Print it to the console. Two, letter inputs. Create five text input boxes that accept only one letter. Make the letter centered in the box. Make the boxes 19% of the width of the, uh, the div wide, div wide uh, uh, and 100 pixels tall. Give each input an ID. Add them to the document. Align the row in the center. Three, make the letters uppercase when they're added. Uppercase each letter. Four, submit button. Create a submit button. Add it to the document. Uh, make the button as wide as the boxes, 22 pixels. Make the text 22 pixels. Add it to the document. Five, check letters. Check, if e check each user input if the letter case one, if the letter is in the secret word, change the input background of that letter to yellow. 
Case two, if the letter is in the word and in the same position as the letter in the secret word, make the input background of that letter green. Wow. Case three, if the letter isn't this in the secret word, make the background white. Case four, if the user letters match the secret word letters print, you win. I, and that's what? it. That's amazing, <laughs> that Andrew. Is that is stunning. That that's is mind blowing. Half of that, a good part of that was me trying to do styling, which I could have solved through doing just using an, an external library to do that, or you could train a model to be more specific or whatever. Um, uh, you might have to pop the open to the white screen to get the full view of that. But uh, that's how advancing, and, and, and you know, in OpenAI, obviously I'm biased because I think we do, we do amazing research here, but other companies are working on code, code systems too. And, and this was an eye opener for a lot of people because I took a model that's a commercially, like a model that's a beta for people to play with and showed what you could do with this without trying to create any other special, I didn't create any special software to work with it, to take my things. I literally told the model. Now it didn't work every time. Like I had to keep trying to figure out the right phrases, the right way to talk to it. Cause it was sometimes like, does it know what I mean on a box here? Does it not? And you notice that I'm still using some terms like div and elements. But that's, this is, we came out with Codex eight months ago, and this is where we are now. And I, I you know, I had people ask, like, well, should I still learn to code? And I'm like, well, yeah, because you've got to learn how to break things down into what each thing does. You oh, know, if holy. you, if, if, <laughs> this is my favorite. I'm sorry. Uh, Bryce just rolled over <laughs> a thing. Can you please, Bryce, in full, explain, uh, 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 Andrew made uh, yeah. Matrix Rain and uh, this is very complex, obviously. Right. So, Bryce, can you please read the, the, in this full? This is that, that, that cool-looking green text. Coming yeah, the down. way when, yeah. When, when they're looking into the matrix. Yeah, of course. In, of course. Yeah. yeah, okay, here's the code. A matrix rain. One, create canvas. Create a canvas and add it to the document. Two, rain. Create a matrix rain <laughs> effect with letters. End it of knew. code. And it, it works. It 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 Matrix it rain. That <laughs> effectively <laughs> is the it's coding. Per, like, yeah. Holy crap. I mean, well, I mean that, how far off again, are that, we? And that's that's a cultural reference. That's but, not. But let me explain up. But that was that was clearly it knew that it. That I was more impressed with Wordle because it didn't. It never yes. seen Wordle. Didn't yes. know what Wordle was. Right. Had no idea what this. This somebody somebody it learned what this effect was. So it's like, oh, I got you. I know what this is. Yeah. Well, and and uh, as uh, that's the most impressive thing, the fact that uh, OpenAI is able to uh, peek around the internet and just sort of like, what does that mean? Let me figure it out. Okay, I got it. And it, it, we get to a place where it's like, um, make Half-Life 2, but starring the Mythbusters, and the Combine are all Agent Smiths, and there's uh, a... Uh, Tumblr lock puzzle, kind of like Bioshock, that shows up every five minutes. And you know, uh, it, it makes something like uh, uh, what is it called? Info infograph? Is that what it is? the Google infograph? Uh, it it makes the uh, that is basically their system that they use in the search engine to know what things are, right? So the infograph knows. Oh, uh, 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 ten things I hate about you is a movie. It knows that it the infograph and, and it probably knows that it's based on the Shakespeare play and, and what year it came out and who's in it and all that stuff. And uh, you know, a lot of that is like, okay, I guess you've just found a way to repackage Wikipedia. But for something like this, where that that is finely formatted data of cultural uh, cultural moments. You can now you can plug into the computer and say, "Make me a matrix thing," well, and, and it knows that. And, and suddenly, it has a, a it has a, in this, a certain amount of humanity. There's a certain amount of humanity for no, knowing human culture, isn't there? Well, and, and uh, given like we've already played around with uh, introducing like the first few lines of a back then it was Night Attack, now it's Great Night episode and then it came comes up with this plausible episode where tom Merritt shows up or teller says hi i'm glad to be here and all that stuff like w w imagine two lines of code make a great night episode face swap all three main characters and then and then it just does it it, it invents it and then all of a sudden justin is behind the board you know huh. yeah the, hey. the, a criticism about that you would <laughs> You'd, you'd hear you'd hear a criticism about these large language models about like well it's just regurgitating things of read and like the case where you said where hey great night and it spits out its version of an episode of great night and people go like oh well what's the use of that and it's like well you gotta you gotta now you gotta do something clever you go you know what this is 
like you just said, now do it with this. What if so-and-so is a guest? What if they're interviewing Mr. T? And it will create an entirely new thing that it was never trained on. And that's what people miss out on. One of the things I try to explain, because there are critics of deep learning, like, oh, it's just, it's just Wikipedia or Google search speeding out. Like, I can, I, when I do demos, I say like, well, I'm gonna come up with two things that we haven't seen, you know, which is like, you know, like let's, let's imagine a crossover between this and this, you know? And, you know, something new that it, like, I'll describe a TV show, like, you know, Severance or something on Apple, and I'll say, plus this, what would you do? And it generates a scenario, I'm like, where did that come from? Well, and and then, well, it's just mixing this. So. The, the, but but there's, there is incredible uh, value in blind spots. Uh, for example, when I, when I did that fake beginning of a nine attack episode, I would hit generate. And at first it was like, you know, Tom Merritt shows up as a guest, Veronica Bellamont shows up as a guest, uh, you know, friends of our teller shows up as a guest. But then it would start coming up with people whose names I didn't recognize. And I would look them okay. up and I was like, oh, we should book them. And all of a sudden I realized yeah. this is a functional booking engine and then all so so basically take this uh, uh, two steps one generate an episode um, uh, uh, publish a list of one thousand guests that appear in in various iterations of this episode uh, print to word document and then and then you know and then maybe maybe step three is find their publicly available contact information and. Uh, and I guess step four would there, be auto generate a invitation to to yeah. get you up all the code. Step five, <laughs> just create the interview, and we'll just say we did it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so there's a thing that 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 uh, a thing called embeddings, which is a, a very it's becoming more of a hot area in in machine learning. It's been around for a while. There's some really cool resources on it. Um, an embedding is basically they we used to be like word embeddings, which is you try to find out what word similar to another word, like dog is similar to puppy, you know, because they're kind of close. And you can imagine in a three-dimensional space, the word dog here and puppy here and cat a little further away, and then motorcycle much further away. And you can give each word an X, Y, Z position, right? So you give dog an X, Y, Z position and puppy, which is close to its position. And then you can, you can compute what's the dot, called the dot product to figure out how close they are. And if you said, I have motorcycle way off over there, and you compute the dot, pro, dot product of that with puppy, you'll see motorcycles much further away than dog. So you all track, yep, right? Yeah. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then that got extended. People said, we could do that with phrases. Instead of just like words is to actually do entire phrases and create these complex sort of, and instead of being X, Y, Z, it might be like, you know, one of the more LL, there's like, a, you know, one model out there does something like 600 dimensions. So it's got 600 different, you know, positions to help describe where it is to relate to stuff. And you can do really meaningful stuff. So let me get to where I'm going. So you could start saying, you could put, we, we, really, we took our, 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 our models, our GPT-3 models, and we use them to produce uh, vectors that have thousands of dimensions, right? So you could create Tom Merritt and Tom Merritt's bio, and let's say do that with 100,000 other people. And then you could say, I want somebody like Tom Merritt, and it would give you a list of who matches closest to it, even though the words may never be the same, and it might be somebody who, Said, oh, you know, this guy went to the same sort of kind of college Tom did and also went into tech. He might make a really good fit for you, too, et cetera. So that's what betting is. There's just a, a big exploding space. Uh, 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 the XYZ coordinate system, when you talked about the uh, puppies being adjacent to dogs, uh, um, a very human leap that I never would have expected AI to be capable of suddenly becomes uh, obviously possible. Um, like for example, uh, 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 let's say the the z axis is time. You know, at the beginning you have you have a puppy being born, you have a dog. There's a, a slightly off center is companionship and affection, uh, and, and and love and stuff. But if you go forward on the time axis, then you come to a dead dog, and a dead dog could be um, maybe maybe slightly to the left, a, 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 a roadkill on a highway. Mm. Uh, but but another z axis dead dog would be the imagery of the the poetic imagery of the rainbow bridge, which is where uh, you know uh, pet owners uh, like to think that their dogs go where they'll wait for them, you know, when they go to heaven or whatever. So then all of a sudden, if 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 the system knows that, you you can you know one line of code uh, write a five minute story about companionship that will make me cry. And they will know to, like it will know to use the poetical imagery of the Rainbow Bridge and not the crass imagery of roadkill at the, at the end.
One of the things that's cool is that uh, when in our announcement, um, uh, I want to make sure I, I stay on message here, is, <laughs> is as these things become more uh, powerful, as these things become higher you know, fidelity, more capable. Yeah, one of the things we did with the update to our model is we introduced the ability that you could take text and I used examples of like, simple examples, I could take text like, you know, uh, I decided to go to the store and then I drove home with my case of diet soda. And you can say, now tell the model, insert in between here, add something between here. I know where it starts, I know where it ends, fill out the middle. And so it's able to figure out, like there's an example we have there, uh, which is inserting text in the middle of text. And so I found actually, if you numbered the sections, it was very good at staying with there and it wouldn't invent new sections. So this is the idea where you can make like lists and stuff and do things like, but you could say, I have a beginning of a story and end of a story. Can you add to what it? Is, what is the actually, middle? What is, what is the conflict? What is the, the relatable is, thing? Well, and, and this also is, speaks to the structure of good speech writing, where it's like, uh, uh, list the things you did. List 10 things that, that happened to you on your trip to the grocery store. And then the speech writing bot would know that, that, uh, that every, you know, let's say 90 seconds, you need to have a surprise of some variety or an aside or a joke or, or, or what have you, something to give that, that heartbeat. I mean, like Kevin Smith is brilliant at this. It's like, well, let, let's, you, let, let me, if we focus on the, on the, on the, uh, examples there of just what, what happens in those surprises, I don't know if you can bring that back up. Uh, but, but it, it is, it is fascinating to see just like, if you put uh, so right now it says high school graduation and moving to the farm, and so the the idea of this being able to come up with conflicts, which is like the heart of all storytelling, right? Right, where where you start and where you end, and the journey in between them, that is a story. Like that's remarkable. The 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 fact that this thing just learns and spits out. Uh, 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 those. I mean, just as I mean, I don't know, and that that's why the it, whenever there's anybody who's like, ah, you know, that's just Wikipedia, or that's just Google spitting it out. No, it's like it's not. It's like <laughs> you are fundamentally making the assumption that you understand what all of Google and all of Wikipedia Holy are cow, just or made could a spit out. Uh, uh, <laughs> th that's amazing. Uh, it says write a poem about uh, the GPT three. I'm a very nice AI. I'm pretty good at writing replies. When I'm asked a question, I give my suggestion. This is a poem I wrote, and I guess the last one. Yeah, and I made a, a poem that rhymes. That's that is incredible. And like the actual wording changes, uh, like by by saying make this in the voice of GPT three. Yeah, it changes some of the word selection. You say format it like a letter and sign it from GPT-3 and it adds dear human and kind regards. Wow. That is really, really powerful stuff, Andrew. Look how when OpenAI did GPT-2, it was a very interesting thing and it was doing some neat stuff. And we talked about GPT-2 on, on this very microphones here. We talked about that and that got my, got my excitement up and I went to GitHub and I read GitHub where people put code. I read every single output of GPT-2 and I was fascinated to try to understand how it was trying to work internally. When GPT-3 came out and OpenAI, because of uh, the kindness of one of our listeners actually said, hey, maybe Andrew, you'd like to play with this. And I played with it and because I was obsessed about GPT-2, you know, I realized like, I'm like, this is gonna be big. This is so much bigger than, than I really thought it could have been. It feels like a long time ago, but it's only two years ago. <laughs> and it is it is less than two years. It was two years ago, like this month or whatever, when I got asked to come in there and I feel like I've lived a lifetime during this period. When, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know I wouldn't know what happened what else happened in the past twenty four months. <laughs> you know, that was a that was a footnote for me, to be honest with you, because being able to play with these technologies, you yeah. know, the human tragedy that befell us. But <laughs> my point is is the rate at which since then now like uh, Wired had an article that we, we actually mentioned in, but they talked about like the code model and they go, it's like GPT-3 for code. And I'm like, the fact that they use GPT-3 in the headline, yeah. GPT-3 for code tells you, but what I'm saying since then, there are brilliant people in other places and there's other amazing technologies. And, and I, I, you know, I'm, I'm a company man, but man, like I'm amazed at what's going on elsewhere. And it started this race of other people developing stuff and advancing it. And this is how fast we came in such a short period of time. I do not think it's going to slow down. 
Uh, I think it's going to accelerate. Right now, uh, I assume some form of limited access is available to anybody who signs up or? Anybody any anybody can apply now and get like immediate access. If you go to openai.com and you click apply, you, it's a very fast thing. You just have to check some boxes and stuff. So we do that. Uh, there is still limitations like, uh, if you're in a country bombing another country right now, maybe not. But, is, um, is, uh, is there any, um, uh, if, I, I guess I'll, I'll not be coy about it. Um, can can uh, should I encourage my daughters to start messing around with this stuff? Because like, I, I think about how we have a generation of kids who grew up playing roller coaster tycoon, and they intuitively understand how effective uh, it is to have a spectacular attraction and then do price gouging. Like they understand economics on a fundamental level. So here's here is here is the thing about large language models, and this is and everybody needs to use this to their to their. And this is this is this is a challenge, and this is a thing to say. And, I, and if I say, you know, I don't give it the amount of due attention that people feel that it deserves. Trust me, I believe it deserves a lot of attention. Large language models are trained by models like this are generally trained trained by looking at things people say. Right. And so when you have a large model, it's trying to pretend it's saying something what somebody says. It looks at text and says, okay. And everything I've ever read, how should I finish this? It's not a personality. It's not an entity that we created that is the sentient, you know, self-aware. I am GP3. It is a system. It is a system that completes text based upon what it was trained on. So if you trained it on the internet and read it and things like this, and you start off something that if you came across that and read it or the internet and you didn't properly scope it, it might say something awful. You know, it might say something mean. It might it might start making you know, a comedy routine. It might do this. Now, if you pre if you preface it by saying, and we have models that have proved upon it, but we kind of trained away its ability to create in other spaces, but that could be very useful. So that's the thing I'd say is like understand, you know, like a random search on Google or whatever, because if you use it, you might get a bad word, you might get a thing, you might get something that might be offensive. There, there, there are stereotypes in there because of learned from some of the some of our bad habits and stuff. And that it's an ongoing effort of an AI overall. Every, you know, everyone's to improve on that. Oh, so my what, thing would be like, what, what was the example of the Microsoft bot? Was it Tay or something where they fed it a bunch of terrible stuff and it became terrible? Yeah. It... Well, and it, that's a it's it's a. Yeah, I mean, there, there are systems where like researchers, you know, with really good intentions have put things out there to hope that people could do that and don't realize that people are going to try to red team them instead. So uh, and, bas basically, uh, 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 parental guidance suggested. <laughs> I, yeah, and so yeah. I would, yeah, that's my advice. I, if I had children that I knew of, uh, although <laughs> some, some, well, some mom in Australia accidentally put my email address. And so I get all these updates from an Australian school about these Australian kids and oh. when they're in and out. And I've been trying to like, this is not my kid. I, I'm like, it's just, you know, so, uh, but if I had a kid, yeah, I'd, I'd love to do this. I'd be showing them how to do this. I want them to understand the stuff, the, the capability. I, I've been able to have a lot of fun and a lot of impact with our models, uh, because I started with studying GPT-2 and playing around with it. And then when you look through a lot of the dark documentation and stuff, you'll see a lot of stuff that I put in there because I just, just spent so much time playing with it. I wonder- um... you know, I work with people who are way smarter than me, way, way, way smarter than me. I just have a lot of spare time and like to play with stuff. And so I, I advise people to play with this stuff and see what you can do. Yeah, I'm gonna jump back into playing with it. Uh, uh, yeah. Especially seeing just how extraordinary it's evolved uh, since I last mm -hmm. week. And, and the thing that I would advise to anybody who's creative wants to play with it, you're going to see, you'll see the examples, the list of examples we came up with. Internally, we go look at a stuff thing. We try to play with it. We try to go look at it all. You know, I'm, I, I, you know, I, I'll go interject myself and say, oh, I can come up with some ideas too. Or like, those are horrible ideas. Why does everything have to be about Chewbacca? Like, just because. <laughs> um, but anyhow, you'll see this long list of examples right now. Um, I believe I wrote most of these. These are the tutorials, like how to do stuff. There's other stuff, new ones in there, but a lot of these were ones that I came up with just by sitting down and going. And if somebody else there had time to do it, they would have done it. But I got, like, okay, I'll just try to make a bunch of these examples. Uh, some, some of the or, examples for audio folks are like uh, analogy maker, JavaScript, one-time function, third-person yeah. converter. And there are a million better examples than the ones here. There are a million better ones, and it just comes down to somebody sitting down there and saying, "Could it do this? Could it do this? Could I, could I do blank? 
And so I encourage people, don't look at what we've done and say, that's all it can do. Look yeah. at what we've done and say, that's a starting point because the best ideas I was able to help out because we have these mm -hmm. super smart researchers that have to spend their time trying to figure out how to build these things mm -hmm. and they don't get enough time to play with them. And so I got to play. And then, you know, other people who play contribute. It's just, uh, it's, what, it's, it's, it's an amazing period. What, one last question uh, functionally for a little bit of tech support is, is it um, uh, something that you manually feed stuff in or can it just, you send it out to the internet and just expect it to find whatever you want? For example, my daughter is working on her first novel. She's 20,000 words into it. And uh, I, I, I wonder if, what would happen if I copied that 20,000 words, put it in as, as, as a seed, and then saw where, where the, uh, uh, the bot would take so it from there. It, it, <laughs> and you it, could beat her to finishing the novel. You're like, hey, yes. I finished your book. So, You'll right. never beat so, me. <laughs> here's, here's the big limitation. Right now, the current model, the limitation is about, is about 1,500, 1,600 words. Okay. Okay. You can give it, you can give it a little summary of a chapter and give it some dialogue and it will continue on of what say what happened before, but it can't process that entire 20,000 words. Got it. Got but, it. But you could, anything you can fit within a 2000 words, like 1500 but, but, words. But you do, words. you do have to feed it something first or, or can it just, you can just expect, I guess, you know what? Uh, even you are, you are, you are, you are looking, you are looking to train out. the model. Yeah. As opposed to asking. You can, it. you you can, we do offer model training where you can actually take a bunch of text. Let's say, uh, you know, you were Tom Merritt and you decided you wanted the Tom Merritt bot. We can take all of Tom's books, yeah. train the model on them, and then give it, start some characters talking. If it cared for those characters before, it would start continuing on to those characters. We could train it entirely on Great Night transcripts. Yeah. And you would be spooked by how good it would be at predicting what you're saying and completing it and even writing your dumb hilarious jokes. Hilarious Justin one-liner after hilarious <laughs> Justin one-liner. Just classic comedy by Justin over and over and over again. And it, it just and it just every other line is Brian Cackles. <laughs> <laughs> Mentions he loves his daughters. This is amazing. <laughs> Very cool. So that's uh, openai.com if people want to check it out. And, and for people to understand what, what to expect, once you get access, we have a thing called a playground. You do not have to program to use this. You don't have to code. You go yeah. into the playground environment and you just start writing words and you say complete. It'll try to complete it. It'll do this. And play with it. Think about it. Have ideas. But I encourage anyone who's curious, you do not have to be a programmer. We have, you do not need to be a programmer. In fact, the more you are in the, the world of words and stuff, you know, the more interesting it will be. Yo, man, you guys got picks. Um, yeah. yes, I have a pick. Uh, our flag means death. Oh, you beat me. You stole my pick. <laughs> you pick stealer. Wow. Uh, uh, I, I, you, I pirated it from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, boy, what a, a show that only grows uh, sillier and more whimsical the further we get into it. Uh, it, you know, I, I've, Th th like, there's a whole cultural discussion that is kind of going on with this show. And I, I, uh, uh, I think that it is very fascinating to kind of see what people take from it, but, uh, using a real story of a very brutal world, uh, uh, to examine among other things, uh, uh, of masculinity and expectation, uh, I think is is fun. I mean, it, it is it is it is such a great uh, uh, exploration of of that. The character work is just fantastic, and uh, I'm having I'm having a really good time. It's one of the shows that's only gotten more confident the the further you get into it, and and I think that's always a good hallmark of a show is when you realize past the first three episodes, like oh, that wasn't their whole. Thing. Right. There's a lot mm -hmm. more here and it is it is growing and getting more confident the they, further it goes along. They really do just let you think in the first three episodes that, well, that's pretty much it. And I'm like, I'm already in. And yeah. then from there, they're like, but what if we added this? You're like, what? <laughs> they're like, what if we added this? Yeah. What? It's <laughs> it's uh it's great. It's extraordinary. It's, it's uh very it is a, it's surprising. It was surprising and very enjoyable. And, uh, and by the way, that's how you get a season two is ending it like season one, which oh, I've well. not seen. I've not seen yet. Okay. Well, not yeah. seen. Uh, <laughs> not and seen. 
I, I, I'll just say this. I think I had only watched the first three or four episodes at first, and then we, I, I had to binge. I had to watch the rest of it for Court Killers this week, and uh, not the journey I thought we were going to be on, uh, and very, very pleasantly surprised. Uh, shockingly relevant discussion we had on the <laughs> on Thursday the Patreon episode of <laughs> Great Night. That's right. <laughs> I, I did a good job of keeping my lips sealed. I thought uh, oh, I was very, as we were having that discussion, I was very excited for you to watch. Oh, ah, very cool. Uh, we, we mentioned it prior, but anybody that hasn't heard it in her previous episode, the, the amazing thing besides how funny the show is, is that how much it was actually based on true events. Yeah. 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 <laughs> of William Steed and Blackbeard. Like that's the thing. And I didn't know that, but if I knew a little pirate history, I'm like, I think I remember I knew vaguely. And then I'm like, oh yeah, no, literally there he did. They did meet. They were buddies. They hung out. And you know, we they drew in everything else who knows. But I'm like, that's that alone. The the major conceit of the thing is true is hilarious. Also shout out to Taiko Atiti for being like, uh yeah, I just want to dress like Aquaman. <laughs> I just kind of want to dress yeah, like no. an all black Aquaman wrong, and wrong, wrong, wrong. Oh, you I'm sorry. Yes, no, shame. It's Mad Max. It's Mad Max. It does, yeah, it does. Oh, it, you mean the, 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 the way he's dressed with the warrior. leather and everything. Yeah. Oh, uh, uh, that's, that's another thing. The, uh, can also be Aquaman. The delightful anachronistic. The Literally major. the missing sleeve. It's Road Warrior. Okay. Uh, All uh, right. I, I, I mean, I I'm very passionate about this. <laughs> yeah, I, I, we had, we I hadn't was so noticed. Excited. I was, I was, <laughs> Just, I thought I mean, everybody yeah. got that joke, the reference. Uh, I like, didn't think I would love it so much when they do things yeah. like say. My bad. <laughs> like for some reason that just tickled me so much is all the, all the No, there is there is an element of like workplace comedy that that is that is omnipresent through it and obviously has been something that that you've seen in Taika Waititi's especially, you know, uh uh well really I guess from the beginning with what we'll, we'll be doing the shadows where the and exceptional and, is yeah. is put like the funniest thing is, you know, Thor shouting, that's my friend from work <laughs> to the Hulk in an arena of a space gladiator circuit or whatever. Uh, 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 but yeah, I think that there's there that, that element of comedy. Do you have the road warrior so did I can you, see? Did you Google it? Yeah. I just had it up here. No, sorry. I was too busy talking and I didn't see it. So there's, there's Taika Waititi. Like, you know, I thought it was just a funny joke because he has the tattoos too. That's fine, but you know, I mean, then we can see just Road, Road Warrior. Warrior. Just show the Road Warrior. Go Google okay, Road hold Warrior. on. Sorry, yeah, man. wait a minute. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. The leather leather jacket and the same the same one sleeve. Yeah, but I don't see a same. dog, so it can't. It, it doesn't <laughs> okay. doesn't match. I don't see the, the Aquaman right. tattoos though. The Aquaman <laughs> tattoos. <laughs> I feel right. like yeah. Yeah. Feel yeah. like and Aquaman tattoos. I don't. Hey, Bryce, three, show Aquaman. Can you bring up sorry. Aquaman? Almost see what I Aquaman looks like. I need Pitbull to play. I don't see Lisa Bonet in yours. I don't see some tried it. Literally, when I saw the mission, I'm like, why does that look familiar? I'm like, and I'm going, oh, and I'm thinking I was the last one to get the joke. It does. It does make a lot more sense as as uh, uh, or it does make a lot of sense with the Road Warrior thing because there is the one mate of Blackbeard's that is just wearing a studded belt on his head, like wrapped around three times, which is like there are elements of the show that are obviously anachronistic, but it's just a studded biker belt around his head, uh, uh, and it's like I was watching it last night, and I'm like. That, I mean, even for this show, which can be fast and loose, like, that's a little silly. <laughs> it's so great. But that it does. The, the Road Warrior thing uh, makes uh, sense. Uh, also, uh, there's, a, there's a character that shows up in the very first episode, so it's not a spoiler, but his name is Admiral Badminton, which is simultaneously the most English sport I can think of and has the word bad in it, so you know how to feel about him. There's so, it's great. Uh. I'm looking, uh, oh God, what's right there really was an Admiral Badminton. <laughs> I bet there was. There probably was. Sounds back English, in those days. yeah. Um, I've got a pick. Oh. oh. Uh, I've been keeping up with and I'm very excited to continue co-signing Severance on Apple TV+. Plus. Uh, this is a fantastic show. Uh, I I think it, it is. It, we're still mid-season on it. Um so I won't talk too too much because it is there's a there's a mystery element to it there's a bit of a suspense element to it but uh, I think it's very inventive and um, I, I really enjoy um, how how much they are committing to the premise that they are doing and how much they are committed to exploring 
as much as they can of that world before you, we have to do the story that obviously is going to happen. It's getting a lot of traction. A lot of hearing things, hearing things about I've, Severance. I've seen the first two episodes, and I don't know if anybody, I think you, the, the premise is mentioned in the trailer, but I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. But um, what I love in really good science fiction, in my opinion, takes one big concept, one big what if thing and says, if this is true, what else is true? If this is true, what else is true? Bad science fiction. And you get, there's a lot of like a, a kind of lo-fi mumble sci-fi where it's like, oh, I'm a time traveler and blah, 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 with something else. Like, wait, go back to that because that's the more interesting story than you trying to meet the girl of your dreams. I'm sorry. You know, um, and, you know, because that, that's that other element means nothing. You could have worked at a Kmart ball and made the difference of here. It is a great example in the two episodes I've seen of if this is true, what else is true? If this is true, what else is true? What would this world be like? What does that really mean? The moral implications of this, they just already go deeper into this than I expected. Production design, fantastic. And you saw who the director is of the, at least the first two. Uh, ben Siller, who is... Uh, uh, he directs the first few episodes and he's like yeah. an executive producer on the show. Yeah, great, great direction, great examples of this. Like I, I've been so far, I'm in love with the show because I think it's just, it's beautifully done. A little bit first, I'm like, and then I got into it and then uh, the premise, I'm like, oh, this is such a, it's a fresh, it's existed in fantasy and science fiction book literature, but never in, you know, Dollhouse sort of touched upon a version of that, but really the way it's explored here it makes you can draw a lot of ethical lines and stuff. All like right. That. Since, since both of you have stolen my two picks, <laughs> uh, uh, I did, I, I thought of a quick counter example that I'll make my pick of, it is mumble sci sci-fi. It is time travel that just shrugs at it and talks about a different story instead. Uh, it's the Dennis Quaid vehicle frequency, which I thought was adorable from the turn of the century. I thought it was a very cute movie. Oh, frequency. And remade into a TV show. Um, I, I don't think it's mumbles. I, I it really was a problem trying to solve a conflict in time. Uh, yeah, but but also there there's sort of a shrug like I don't know the sun time travel anyway. Oh yeah yeah <laughs> no, I don't mean the method. When I mean mumble sci-fi, I mean like uh like some hipster sort of stuff where like I built a cardboard time machine and and it doesn't really play oh, got out it, it, got it, got anything. It. Yeah yeah no like that. I don't, no, I don't, but Brian, regard, I don't regardless, least... my, my, my pick is frequency, and they do it's gloss great... over all the sci-fi uh, yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's fine. Frequency, but, is yeah. a, frequency is one of those movies. It was like like that, like butterfly effect. Like that's actually a fun movie. Like, there's a couple of them. Yeah, like, they, there's like no like, explanation given. He's like, uh, yeah, sometimes I just go back to things that feel real bad. Groundhog Day, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, like, cool. look, you you can do magic stories. Like, but just focus on what's interesting right. as, as opposed to the, the, what's, what's not, or, you know, there's a new movie out, or I, I just read a review for it. I don't know if it's at some festivals or something like that, that does this with like the multiverse because their, their thing was, they just kind of hate, I think it's called like everything all at once is the name of it, but it's like, uh, uh, their thing was that like the multiverse is a very hot and interesting idea to a lot of people, but mostly it's a conceit so three Spider-Men could be together. And mostly mm -hmm. it's a conceit so you can bring back characters that have died. Uh, whereas like their their whole idea was like, no, the multiverse is the story. <laughs> if there is a multiverse, we need to be talking only, only about, about exactly everything <laughs> yeah. that goes on in the multiverse. And it's fine when it's Spider-Man and, right. and you know, whatever, because that's really what we want. That that that's fine. But if in any other story, <laughs> that's the <laughs> only thing. It's the greatest thing that's ever I, happened in the world. I I analogy be like. Like imagine, okay, I'm gonna have a school for magic and wizardry. And these kids have this one kid who is like, you know, was actually affected in a way he's destined to become like one of the most powerful wizards ever. And they go to the cafeteria and they found out that they raised milk prices by 10 cents when really only a five cent milk price raise was justified. <laughs> and they decide to investigate that. Actually, I'm, if it was a comedy, it'd be great. But it was, you know, that was, was Harry was, Potter and the lunch lady, you know. <laughs> I'd be there for that. <laughs> I would. Yeah. I would feel like that would be okay in a book called Harry Plopper. I, and if Harry, yeah. if that again, if Harry was, Plopper, if it was I a mean, comedy, be fine with it. But sometimes you get stuff like, "Wait, I go back to this thing going yeah, on." What this is yeah, what happened? This way more interesting. Uh, yeah, there's definitely Wizards. a TV show we just finished watching that I think 
did, did not uh, did not do that amount of thinking about the thing. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, what show? Uh, uh, we 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 officially have we finished uh, raised by wolves. Yeah, on. do not intend to watch season three. Yeah, we are gonna. Oh, I'm ready. I'm all set for it. I love. Oh yeah. Yeah, because like I, I they're stacking things up. You see them stack up, but I have no idea where it's gonna go. I'm I'm still entertained. Yeah. But, um. So yeah. Uh, uh Andrew, but, did you have a pick? Yeah, and I was always got to give season two a pass because season one, we love it. And season two, the writers think they have an idea of what the audience wants. And then they go, oh, no. Okay. Gotta, <laughs> Maybe we should focus strict. on Stringer Bell again. <laughs> yeah. Genre is very, very much like that, though. Remember, like, yeah. Walking Dead season two, uh, Hero season two. It's just <laughs> like... Um, so my pick is uh, I finished all three seasons in very much a symptom of when we could build a world, we didn't know what to do with it. And I feel like the showrunner was deciding other things he could be working on by the end of that. And that is Legion. Mm. Have you seen all three seasons of Legion? I, I don't know if I made it through the third. Yeah, I don't think I finished the third or maybe I, I it became my I'll watch this going to sleep show um interesting analysis there gentlemen kind of proven my point it is Noah Hawley is incredibly talented his his ideas and vision you know he took this character Legion in the comic books is Professor Charles Xavier's son who we didn't know about initially who is an omega level mutant super super powerful but also has the problem of having multiple personalities and so Noah Hawley was approached by Fox to say hey would you like to do something with one of the Marvel properties one of the X-Men properties that we have and he's like, I like Legion. I'd like to do a Legion story. And so he created this very cool 60s-esque sort of story of David Holler dealing with his voices in his head. And it turns out they're real. And it kind of goes in sort of an interesting place because he gets out of the asylum and meets up with other mutants. And then season two, and season two is just this long road trip sort of thing that I very beautifully done. Very, very beautifully done. The characters are great. Uh, Bill Irwin, seeing him, if you remember Bill Irwin, is a physical comedy. He plays a great character there. It just felt like if there were parts of it where I go, like, oh, this, if they'd made this season had been three of these mini stories, I would have loved it. But, yeah. Um, I think by, bit, by I, season two, they had lost some of the plot and it was very much wrapped up in the fact that Noah Hawley can make pretty much anything visually interesting and there are enough character archetypes that are exciting and he can keep throwing new ideas like at you but it was it was the promise of the first season being a really uh a solid story i felt like was kind of lost in season two and nobody told me to watch season three so i it, assume that it totally spun it, out there were also um uh talent changes where they kept the same character but now they're in a new body which means an actor who is not the actor you liked in season one is portraying the character in season three and uh that i think that had a lot to do with me falling off who uh i uh, what's her name uh, uh aubrey plaza just just she's big in season three is she well oh yeah maybe she's i'll watch no no, no, no. she becomes him. remember because she dies in season one and then comes back the right. sister with the sister's body uh okay but it so, turns but, but Aubrey yeah, yeah. Plaza is still it like they, they physically make her Aubrey Plaza right okay yeah I I don't blame you for going <laughs> wait and that's because she does I think first part of season two I don't think she's as prominent there and yeah you, and you sort of feel like she kind of made her exit but then season three she comes in she has her own arc and what but yeah it's it's a like David Holler's mind oh he's a lot of things going his stuff on. is great uh, uh Fargo is incredible yeah. yeah, I know Holly. Like, yeah, I'm. I'm like, I. I would give it like, he's a brilliant person and super smart. And I'm. He's doing the Alien TV series now. Oh, nice. I'm in. Let's see. Let's see how it goes, gentlemen. It's been weird. <laughs> Full bladder attack. Alrighty, everybody. <laughs> Just start peeing on everyone. Ah, <laughs> no! I shouldn't have sat in the blue seats. <laughs> uh, really? Man, this new Gallagher stuff went down a way different yeah. curve. 
Uh, we're going to take a minute. To These be... comedians have gone too far. I need to apologize for peeing on my seat. <laughs> but they'll never apologize. Hello, everybody. <laughs> we're going to do after things in a minute. Yeah, man. Uh, uh, good show. Good times. Good show. Uh, yeah. Stuff. Man. Stuff and stuff. stuff. Hey, uh, season finale, World's Greatest Con out. Ooh, go, get it. Ooh, go get it. We dive into the surprisingly uh, 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 scandalous and unsettled story behind the only correct to the number showcase in Price is Right history. Ooh. A lot of people, in their own words, have told the story, and there are significant disputes on the facts. Mm. And I will say, uh, uh, above and beyond anything else that we covered this season, including the 50s quiz show scandals, this by far had the most coverage. Mm. Like, multiple documentaries, feature articles, books. Wow. For all because people love the Price is Right so much, man. They, so, man. they love it. Yeah, the little, the little, the little wand microphone and the car. Yeah, a new car. Hardcore fans too. Hardcore fans. Mm -hmm. The gold. Shout out to the Golden Road .net, which is a, a hardcore Price is Right fan group. Is that like, uh, like you know that they've got like a the Jeopardy archives? Like you can just go and look up any show date and any yeah. question, and they, you can find out exactly what, who answered what, and how mm -hmm. much. You know, is it something like that? Oh, like uh, very much so because Price is Right, obviously a price guessing game. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the key elements that is discovered, uh, uh, especially through this episode, is that uh, they recycle a lot of these items, and therefore the prices are retained. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, so so there's a web page that says exactly how much a four pack of snack packs costs and whether or not when it was last used whether it's currently in rotation uh, blah 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 right so you got to remember it you got to quiz yourself on it it's a lot of information uh and the only rule with price is right being a very um you know a, a people custom a a a uh, <laughs> guest what am i contestant contestant, contestant. friendly game is that you just can't bring a physical list mm. with anything written on it. Um, other than that, it's fair game. If you just memorize, if the list is is in your own noggin. If I mean, if if what you're being judged on is how well you know something, yeah, going and learning that is like not there. That is not cheating. No, and nor nor I, would be somebody yelling the answer from the audience if um, you knew that somebody knew a lot of it, or uh, or having uh, against the rules would be somebody uh, uh, in support of a recently fired veteran producer affecting the game, <gasps> or maybe you just came up with this random string of numbers totally by yourself, which is what the winner says happen wow. who do you believe well hear all their stories yourself and come to your own conclusion we actually come up with our own conclusion but you can come up with your own conclusion <laughs> at uh world's, world's greatest, greatest con 0205 Ooh. the price is right's perfect bid very cool that's very cool i'm excited and that brings i mean aside from our q a episode season two to a close wow it uh feels yeah, but if you had any celebrity endorsements, because I really only watch things that really celebrated uh, stage and well, whatever performers um, like a thing. You know, uh, we had a little tweet from... Should, maybe maybe sh we should save this for oh, the show. Oh, some local, like, dinner theater dude? Yeah. yeah. Your, your drama teacher from high school, Justin? Oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, yeah, should we save this for after things? Or, or Andrew, do you need to use the bathroom? Yeah. I'm, oh. I'm a professional. Cool. Okay. Do you, uh, and do you uh, have a hard? Do you have an out today? Not to later. I'm good. You're good, good for okay. hours, Bryce. Okay. Well, I'm good for like two hours. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna go grab a bottle of water really quick. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna do the same. Okay. 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 
Oh, all right, all right. I'm just going to spoil the last episode of season one of Our Flag Means Death. No. Just, oh. No. Oh. No. What? No. What? No. Oh. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> What's funny is like that what? No, I want to make it Owen Wilson, no. but, but it's Mark Wahlberg. Mark. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Man, he straight up just slapped Chris Rock. Not Mark Wahlberg. No. Will Smith. Yeah. Slapped him. He's fresh. What did five Got fingers little... say to the face? Slap. Yeah, the five fingers. Then they then they cursed. Yeah. They cursed on television. Yeah. Well, I guess they didn't. They got bleeped out in America, but not, but 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 Japan and Japan and Australia, yeah, they right. got it. They got a raw. They, they got a show. Which is really the Japanese translation is really funny because they're only translating Chris Rock's some of what Chris Rock is saying. Yeah. And none of what Will Smith is saying. Yeah. So like when he's like, it was a G.I. Jane joke. <laughs> it's like you hear <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What's it a G.I. Jane? Um Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, 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 I don't know. <sighs> I was made sad by everything. I I don't know I, how I, much. I, I, I was I, really surprised at how sad I was. It just is just so lame. It's just so bad. Like, and and then everybody with their takes. Everybody's Look, got takes, and I, the takes are just worse than the event itself. Like. I, th I think it just shows how depleted <laughs> we, we as a society are <laughs> over the last few years. Yeah. I mean, but then because again, th also, it's like, time, like uh, I mean, we like, weren't that way when we saw Janet Jackson's nipple. Who boy, man, we were excited. We're like, oh, damn, is that a nipple? Ah, FCC people were upset. Throwing fines yeah. and people are getting all fiery. And we're all like, let's all talk about, wait, is that a sun around? Like, what Her is nipple, that? Yeah. Nipple shield. Yeah. But this, we're just like, ah, more of this. No, I think people were really excited about it. I don't know. It's just, it's just so... I like both of them. I really wanted Will Smith to have his kind of moment in the sun, and he tarnished it. Oh, well, he had just a moment. A, and that's just a bummer. Especially because also it's like... Yeah. The, he even mentioned it in his speech, but it's like portraying Richard Williams is a I'll just put it this way there's a reason why they didn't let Richard Williams go do press for the movie because if Richard Williams went and did press for the movie about himself uh, there would probably not be the same Oscar possibilities because he might just say something random that would totally derail the point of what they wanted to do they would rather everybody be thinking about Will Smith's portrayal of Richard Williams as being eccentric but his heart was always in in the right place and then it's like he's got to do something that is over the line and it's like uh, even for that portrayal which obviously venus and serena very much wanted it's just a it's just a bummer on on it's a 5d chess bummer it was a great movie his performance in there was fantastic it was a great and it was a very great movie about family and values and all of that and and that's that that is the big bummer and like yeah, the other the you know the the williams sisters just can't get a break this award season between you know i do have jane camp wonderful news though i Sad. found out last night that josie has not yet seen nobody which is on hbo max which means i get to watch nobody again it's good. Yeah. It's great. You should put that on Twitter and, and everybody's going to feel better about that. No, I'm just saying it's great news. If, uh, yeah. That should have been your comment right after that happened when everybody was oh, talking hey. about it. Like, hey, guys, I know there's a lot of conversation, but I got some news. Yeah. I, listen, I know just, we're all bummed out, but it's going to make counter, your day. Yeah. I get, I, get, I get to watch this ultra violent movie with my uh, teenage daughter. Yeah. Out on the counter. My mom just put out a big box of chocolates, so Aww. I am excited. Uh, so see? everybody, lighten up, everybody. There's good news in the world. <laughs> this is uh, what we need. Yeah. Appreciating the little things, everybody. Like, you know, Brian being able to watch violent movies with his daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Coolest dad ever. I had friends, like, I'd be like, 
I'd be like, oh, you like you ever see like aliens? Like, oh, I was a kid when that came out. I'm like, my dad took me. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like it's awesome. You know, I, like I just I, different. Each child's different. Like my nieces don't. You know, my my brother's not going to show them scary stuff because they don't like scary stuff and they don't process it. You know, I'm 13 years old and I'm like, I want to see the one where the girl's head spins. You know. <laughs> All right, are you ready for some after things? Ready. All right. I will count you in, Andrew. In three, two. Hello, and welcome to the After Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello. Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. So I want to start with a, a kind of an obscure recommendation that I don't know if you guys heard about, but uh, I've been involved in the field of magic for years. And one of the people I look up to is a guy named Teller. Mm-hmm. And recently on Twitter, he recommended a podcast, mm-hmm. which kind of goes into like hoaxes and cons and things like this. And I think it sounded kind of similar to what you guys are working on. And I think the fact that a high level guy like Teller is recommending it, it's kind of cool. Well, and when so- you when you say recommend recommending, I mean, I what, was it like a tepid reference to it or? No, he really liked this thing. I don't know about your thing, mm-hmm. but he really liked this thing. He says, I think we can read it. Enough. We can read it right now here, Bryce, if you can put it back up. My ingenious friend Schwood's podcast is called. Is World- that like, wow, it's weird. It's like almost like Brushwood, but yeah. it's not the same. It's called World's Greatest Con. Oh. It's funny. Oh, they're using your name. Mm-hmm. They're using your name. <laughs> Actually, here, let me read the rest of this, and then, then I'm going to put a pin in somebody in the New York Times listens to the podcast. Uh, yeah. uh, it's funny, fiery, charming, and sometimes horrifying take on history, trickery, and personal stories. The second season starts tonight. But- fine but if you haven't heard the first it uh it starts here and then he links to the website uh uh wow just hey. uh, uh an amazing cosign uh, by it, teller it it, uh, it was deeply deeply flattering yeah and uh of uh, uh it, 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 i think most people know that uh, he's not one to uh, <laughs> liberally just you know lavish praise on things that he doesn't really enjoy um <laughs> i think i think uh uh can, can I, I don't know if I if I should say the, the the magician's name or if this is public, uh, but his prayer is oh 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 no I, is that, I, is that I think, public yeah he's said it he's uh, uh Matt Donnelly has said many times on Penn Sunday School that his prayer or no no, no or is it Piff's no I think it, it is Piff's Piff's, it's Piff's prayer. prayer yeah that's, uh, that's that, what it Piff, Piff said, the magic dragon he says may I never know what t- Teller truly thinks of my act. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and that's somebody who they work with all the time. Like who is like thought of as a protege to to Penn and Teller. But but that is uh, uh, obviously Teller is somebody that thinks very deeply not only about magic but also art. And and it was incredibly gratifying to who's, who's, have him. Whose Twitter feed is this? This who's is his Twitter. Account? This is the Twitter Great account? Night. Uh, the Great Night Twitter account. Sorry, oh, uh, was yeah, it following uh, Teller? Jiminy Benny. Uh, Jiminy Jiminy Jiminy. It is now. It is now, as far as anybody who knows who's watching and doesn't have access to Twitter analytics. Uh, hey, a uh, real quick pro tip for anybody who wants to support a thing. Uh, in the world of Twitter, uh, you can't just keep retweeting the same thing over and over again. However, what you can do is retweet other people quote tweeting a thing. So, like for example, if people were to say, "That's amazing," "Teller is great," so I bet this show's great. That's a thing I could retweet. <laughs> but I can't mm-hmm. retweet your retweet of Taylor's tweet. And uh, two things to add to that. You can click untweet and retweet your own tweet, and it will often go in front of new people if you have a large following uh, algorithmically. Uh, oh, oh, I'm hearing this for the first time. <laughs> I'll give that a try. Uh, <laughs> uh, just telling for people who maybe didn't know that. Thank you. This is, uh, I'm, I'm excited. I don't understand how conspicuous we're supposed to be right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Second thing is if you like a thing, you can retweet the thing a person said, but then retweet with your own quote. Because then that gives them something that they can retweet. Yeah, yeah there's a virtuous so cycle if you, there. If you liked it, like, oh, I love the show. This was great. This episode was really good. That's even more helpful than a retweet in many cases. Because now yeah. ah, I can retweet what you said. And so if you want to create something for people, like, yeah. Uh, hypothetically, cool. I may have been waiting a few hours to quote tweet Teller and say, for those of you who don't know, season one was about Operation Mincemeat, and season two is about game shows. Hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, I, Unfortunately, oh. season three is about an Inteller fool us in hell. Oh it's no! Called, yes, yeah. Yeah. That's it's the ultimate takedown, the ultimate betrayal. We should. That's, I I I forged a friendship with Teller over twenty five <laughs> years, only to betray him. <laughs> this is, this the, is world. the world's greatest con. <laughs> I could name a couple magicians that you could have give you. Uh, so uh, with with season two, uh, season two wrapped up today, or that you've got a bonus episode to, to put out still. Uh, how did it go? Uh, like how did the 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 season go? Yeah, um, I'm very happy with it. I mean, there's there's uh, uh I mean, do you feel like that from you've from, got from, the story a, from out? a production point of view? You just listen to this stuff so much, like you just you hear it a lot. You're 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 just you kind of dealing with it, and then you're dealing with minutia on minutia on minutia, and then it's notes on notes on notes, and uh, uh, you're Brian's getting it. Brian's voice. Uh-huh. Well, uh, uh, all right, this might be getting too real right now, but uh, we 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 did a, a publicity tour of some other podcasts, and I figured out real quick that the way to promote it is to basically give a miniature uh, one man show of highlights of it, and. Uh, <laughs> And Justin points out like, uh, wow, man, you sure are polished, nailing every word. Pity you couldn't have done that during production. (laughs) 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 Oh, my God. What a tyrant, Brian. Just, just, God. If you came back for season two to work with this guy, James Cameron right now is going, geez, that dude's rough. I mean, but but of course, the, the reason is is because uh, 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 at, when I'm doing it, uh, you know, for a podcast, I'm just basically singing an album I've listened to a hundred times, and so I don't have to think about what I'm saying. And not under the cruel rape of Justin Martin. Really young either, too, exactly. So it's- just, just... <laughs> Like Mephisto perched over his shoulder, like read the script. Uh, no, uh, 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 it's it's uh, uh, it really was funny though. It was no, it was very. So there's just so much audio. There's just it's just like there's just nothing like getting like a like well, an hour and a half to two hour block of audio that you know is going to edit down to like thirty minutes. Yeah. So so one thing that you guys talked about in for season one was. Uh, your writing style, which is very iterative, right? You're yeah. constantly writing and rewriting and updating and updating and updating. Do, how do you feel like that process went for season two? Do you feel like that process was shorter due to more confidence? Do you feel like it was longer due to knowing better how to uh, uh, how to work well, that system? Also, we have to add, you know, there was one episode last season that we worked with Meryl Barr, um, and he wrote the episode but did not record it. I recorded it and edited it. In this season, we had Will Saddleberg come in, who uh, is working with Dog and Pony Show, and he what he not only wrote the script, but also recorded and edited the the two of the episodes this season. Uh, and then, like at a certain point, I took over like a a fully populated audition file as opposed to just having a script and 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 having it uh, a push through. So like that was an added. Com- uh, uh, a complexity but in general i would say i think we knew more of the dna of of what goes into an episode we knew what was missing we knew we knew what needed to be there like so i think it was it was a more confidently produced season the, uh, uh all of that is true however uh there is the multiplier effect of season one we told one story over four 30 to 40 minute chapters this time we did five stories uh yeah just shy of an hour each and uh, all of season one was a story that I knew, uh, and I was the one that, that suggested, you know, I was yeah. like, hey, this is, this is a thing I like a lot, and I have a lot of thoughts about. Um, season two, uh, uh, I, I, I knew the space I wanted to play, and I knew some of the anthology, but, but some of them were brand new stories, and um, uh, we learned some lessons about, like, how important it is that before I even try to go through a script, uh, that 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 I have that I know the story as well as I knew uh, the Operation Mincemeat story, and and I think I think season three will be better in that regard. Yeah, I mean, I I I, I think this was a test to kind of expand the idea of what the show could be. You know, one uh, we didn't want to get locked into telling one massive story every season. We wanted the ability to tell. 
uh, shorter stories. And we, uh, we also didn't want to get locked into being a history podcast. Well, it's specifically a World War II history right. podcast, right? I think on some level, we'll always be a history podcast in, in terms of like the stuff has happened in the past. But uh, we didn't want to get locked into that specific war history or, or, or anything like that. And so this was, I think also it, it furthered the DNA. I think the secret DNA of the show is that it's world's greatest cons. And yes, every once in a while, we're going to tell a story about what you think of as a con artist. But what we're trying to find are the very interesting stories that are maybe outside of somebody robbed somebody for money. Uh, uh, and, and we, you know, being in the world of game shows gave us that ability and, and a lot of the ideas we have going forward. Are and, and also keeps us true to the kind of stated subtitle of exploring history's, um, uh, uh, history's greatest deceptions, you know, uh, and, and where and when that is. Um, whether it's a big tale or a small tale, like uh, episode five that came out last night is, uh, in, it's the first time we've done this. We didn't try to even pitch that this was the world's greatest con. We say it's a genuine whodunit mystery on this, our season finale of world's greatest con. Yeah. Like, which is in the name of the show. Also in the chat, Princess Delirium says something very nice. Uh, Brian sounded more confident in the telling of stories in season two, more comfortable in the format, maybe. Uh, I think there's some of that. Um, you know, we 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 didn't know that there were these kind of rhythmic, you know, ballyhoos of of the world's greatest con. You know, that that all evolved naturally during season one, but now we have those, and we sort of can feel the the lyricism. The rhythm, yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, That's great. I'm so proud of you guys what you've done with that. We'll just and uh, I I will say. There are there. We're not done. We're not done. Although season two is formally kind of uh, uh, at least the produced episodes are done. We still have a Q and a episode uh, and we have another fun treat coming. I won't, I won't say an episode, but there is a fun treat uh, coming for, uh, for folks who, especially who enjoyed the first season uh, in, in a few weeks. So is it another captain Morgan? My heart. <laughs> we just dro- we world just world dropped the same, the same thing. Not- like, could you imagine? People are like, "What is this?" Just stop it! Stop it! Uh, yeah, uh, no, it is. It, 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 stole it's, my boat. It's a really <laughs> funny thing that we will uh, that we will have for people. But uh, uh, by and large, the, the reaction to this season has been out of this world. Especially everybody who joined the Patreon. Uh, it was. It was great when we were in vegas we 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 talked to teller and and to hear from his from him to hear how much he he loved uh season one was uh you know there are there are a few ways that when you create stuff i mean whenever you create stuff and especially if it breaks into a wider audience you're going to get people that it, it it just isn't for they accidentally walked into a a place that they thought was barbecue and it turned out to be serving tacos and they're just going to be like this isn't barbecue one (laughs) star uh but it helps a lot when when teller is complimenting your stuff and you're like uh uh you're not teller uh opinion invalidated (laughs) one star (laughs) review uh uh uh, teller liked it uh answer that one atheists do you (laughs) checkmate checkmate do you you feel like uh, do you feel like user feedback has uh, has was was there any pieces of user feedback that shaped season two? Uh, uh no. Well, they they well, still kept Brian, Bryce. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was that was the number one complaint. Well, I, Actually, it is the, literally the number one complaint is like narrators ported on a little thick talking about his own stories. Well, I, <laughs> oh jeez. <I, I>, <laughs> <laughs> but again, just... number one complaint means of the ten complaints. Yeah, exactly. Four of them. Well, that, you and, know? and also, biography was a little self-serving. <laughs> Again, and that's and that's the thing is like with any kind of negative feedback, what I have I have learned through this process more than ever is like if the negative feedback is accurately describing things you very much tried to do on purpose, on purpose, that's fine. You want that because again, yeah. they're just they're walking in. 
they wanted more of a Wikipedia dump of things. They didn't want it. But our our point, the reason why Brian is on the album art uh, <laughs> is that this is Brian Brushwood's interpretation of these events. So if you're like, I don't know, a little too much Brian for me, then that's fine. You you wanted tacos. You walked into the barbecue stand. That's, that's okay. I would it'd be better if you didn't leave a one star review, but that's fine. You, you have you have you have your ability to do that. The one thing that I will say is that certainly whenever you're telling one story over four episodes, I think that we justified it excellently in in season one. I don't I don't look back on it and say that it was too stretched out. But some people were like, "Hey, you probably could have told this in like well, uh, uh, stuff you should know." Told it in one episode, and it's like that's fine. They could, they did. That's great for them. We did it in four. But I think that there was an element of doing the anthology that we're like, hey, we can do one episode stories as well. And, right. and I think we wanted. So if there was a reaction to to anything uh, that that might have been it to just demonstrate that that wasn't it. our point was never we're going to stretch out every story. Uh, our point is we're going to tell these stories in the space that we believe they deserve. And fooling Hitler deserves four episodes. These stories deserve one well and you know? and, and also they're, they're they're smaller in the case of the fooling hitler story there were also four important uh fundamental lessons of deception that needed to be taught along the way you yeah. know from the genesis of the idea to you know like you you can't fool uh, you can't con a system you can con a man you know and uh uh the the reality of of what it's like to uh take a hypothetical idea and make it truly visceral and uh, then that moment, the, the moment of surrender and so on. I think those were important chapters, and I'm pleased that we did it for that. I don't think that the stories we told in season two needed that. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that there were four lessons in each of those stories. I think there was one or two good lessons in there, in each one. Yeah, yeah. I I, think, yeah. And back to your earlier point, too, that you, when you create stuff and you're trying to look at the world of feedback, is sometimes you want notes to know, like, is this for my audience? Is my audience liking it? But your exa example of, you know, going to t getting tacos instead of barbecue, like that's a problem that, you know, as a writer, you realize that there's a disconnect between how this book presented itself and how this person understood it yeah. and then how they reviewed it. And it's like, like, I mean, like, should I spend all my day writing reviews of Disney XD television shows, you know, like you oh, should specifically, I wonder. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Aside from, I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, go take apart. Like I'm going to go write my review of the twilight series. I'm going to take this. To my dude. It's not, it's not my thing. You know, if it's something that's in my alley, it's if I follow it and whatever, then I'd feel like, oh, this is where I felt, felt this, whatever. And so you always have to weigh that as a creator and go, is this somebody who did got the wrong thing? Did I do something wrong and presented it to them? And that's the danger of sometimes like, oh, I just want to promote, like never promote a book or a creative thing under false pretenses. Yeah. If you're dependent upon the reviews, because yeah. you, you, that's where you pay the price. Um, having a teller, having somebody like that come out and signal out and saying you're doing this quality can mean a lot because sometimes you put an effort that is invisible to most people. They do not see it. They don't see the real effort for this. They just hear words and say, oh, I like them. I didn't. And that sometimes you have getting praise from a peer can mean a lot or somebody you look up to can mean a lot because you know that they see things that they appreciate the little details that you put a lot of effort into. And often you don't get enough credit in creators for that. It's like, you know, like I spent, you know, I spent five days figuring out this two paragraphs to explain this thing as succinctly as I can. So I get that dramatic element somewhere else. And like, I don't want people to notice that. But a really creative writer might notice that and who I respect, and that means something to me. And that helps a lot. And I have an expression which is like, uh, if the monkeys at the zoo howl at you, does it make you angry? And we use that kind of like, why, when you should not be phased by yeah. criticism or stuff like this. And people often like, somebody said something like, cool. Like, in your head, you have to figure out who is worthy of getting you upset and not. And the answer can't be, Oh, anybody who criticizes me? No, like, like there's a short list of people. If if Justin or Brian called me up on the phone to say, "Hey, I think you crossed a line here somewhere," I'm gonna listen. Yeah, you know, I'm gonna pay attention to that. And, you know, and, like, like uh, well, and and likewise, I do think it merits at least a cursory examination of the comments that season two got because if let's say an outsized number of them were saying, 
I think I, I fear this show is losing its way. What I liked about season one was this, it was blank, blank, and blank. it's not yeah. this in here. Then, then, then that's that's useful feedback, so mm -hmm. you could course correct. But we we did not get any of that. Uh, we, we got we what we got was. That guy talks about himself. <laughs> well, and, and also a, a lot of those those things, we don't know whether it's about season one or season two, right? right. Like, especially on iTunes. But uh, in in general, what we were worried about uh, with season two, which I think we can now say that it's it's all come out, is we were worried that it's like, what? Game shows? Give me another <laughs> Hitler story. I thought this was the Hitler podcast. <laughs> Brian cries and Hitler gets beat. That's your brand. And it's like, like we were worried that that was, that that was what, what, what some of the reaction was going to be and, and people would view it as too low stakes. And that's kind of why we, we gave such comfort food of, of game shows because it's like, who doesn't love games? Who doesn't have a fond memory of, of watching game shows? Uh, and and so thankfully we I don't we do, we didn't get any of of that which I was thrilled about because and if, Brian and I if, Brian pointed out if we can do Hitler gets beat and the perfect bid on Price is Right the galaxy within those two poles <laughs> is enough for us to go a million seasons that, and that's that's a big what you get away with is often fascinating because like like it's sort of analogous but. When I was back in the day pitching TV shows and stuff, and I'd get into these arguments with producers and be like, no, people won't believe that. They won't believe it. I'm like, it all comes down to the credibility of how it's shot and the performer. I said, that's that's really what it comes down to. And I said, I'm going to show you a clip, and you're going to ask me the completely wrong question after this, germane to what we're talking about. And then I would show them Darren, Darren Brown's zombie arcade. Yeah. Where, and people afterwards, they go, was that ethical? Was that ethical? Was that ethical? I'm like, nobody's asking was that real? Yeah. And I said, that's the thing. If I pitch this to you, what if I hypnotize people in arcade and make them really think they're fighting off zombies and they're confused by this? You'd be like, that's the stupidest thing in the world. Nobody ever do it, blah, blah, blah. But because it was convincingly done and Darren Brown has charisma and believability at the end of it, you're asking, was this ethical? Not was this real? Yeah. And that's the thing where, you know, he won. He, that's why Darren Brown was so successful was because you bought all of that. It was so constructive for the thinking person, a person with a slightly higher IQ to go, whoa, oh, well, I don't know how it's done. And, you know, well, and, and also hard. you, you um, <clears throat> like, like any classic uh, misdirection, or as I like to think of it, just direction, um, you introduce a shinier, better object. And, you know, we were talking about uh, our flag means death. Um, uh, the comedy is so good. That's the shiniest thing. And there are other things that 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 other people want to talk about. But I'm like, I'm I'm still on how funny this show is. And in uh, I think you're 100 percent right. And, and yeah, yeah, the likable people and funny stakes is just if you like the characters, it'll go a long way. And uh, to the topic of you know, Justin, when you're, you know, you talk about like at the end of it's just words and you just, you don't know what to think of a thing because you've just seen it through so many iterations. I'll bring up one analogy too. was like season one of The Witcher. The biggest criticism yeah. was the time jumps, right? Um, season two, they didn't do that. And they even made a joke about it. And I really enjoyed season two of The Witcher. I thoroughly enjoyed it. But the fact that the producers kind of put a slide joke in there tells you they probably had a big debate yeah. during season one. Should we do this? Should we not do this? Unlike Game of Thrones, the last season, where I don't think there was a lot of debate about a lot of stuff. I think they just did stuff yeah. and they got criticized and they got, you know, it would hurt. They took it personally because they weren't really, they didn't, they didn't have a better, like for season one, like I'm sure there was a debate, like, should we do this? And like, like, yeah, hey guys, uh, remember that debate? We were wrong, but they loved it anyways. Let's go do season two and we'll, we'll take that note and work from there. Um, be helpful. So. I don't know. I never know when I finish a thing. I never know if my thing is good. And even after people tell me it's good or not, I still don't know. And I just had that with, I did my third uh, Sloan McPherson story, uh, Sea Storm, which comes out tomorrow, by the way. And um, I we, still don't know what the audience is. Okay. Where can we pre-order it right now? Amazon, yeah. I just go to Amazon, Andrew Maine or Sea Storm or something. Yep. Um, but, uh, and again, not to say, well, this is, this is the final, you know, deciding, but like, it was selected Publishers Weekly. It was a starred review. Mm -hmm. Publishers Weekly made it a pick of the week last week. And that's one of these things where you go, okay, well, I know it can't be garbage because there are hundreds and hundreds of books that came out last week. Yeah. 
and yours and yours was 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 started. I I I will say the one thing that I have found that I like the most producing as opposed to being kind of talent and producer is that I can focus mostly on am I doing Brian justice as opposed to is this good? Right? And I think sometimes when you like for you Andrew you're coming up with the ideas. You're laying out the 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 uh, outline. You are filling it in. You are also your your first editor to see whether or not this is good. So by the time that it gets to somebody else, uh, they are they have a, a very different role. Which is like I think from my relationship to World's Greatest Con, I'm helping with the idea. Like from the very beginning, I'm like trying to just put Brian in positions where not only is he good during production but he is in a creative place where he is adding the brianisms that need to be added so it will always be authentically brian and then in the edit it is like how do we put that on the grandest scale so brian is as smart and funny and charming as he could possibly be and so i just know that if i'm following that north star then it can't be bad Unless I listen and, to yeah, it and it's bad, and then I'm like, we need to totally change it. But like, <laughs> but but it, it but that's always the goal I'm trying to serve, as opposed to like, is this the greatest? Is this the best podcast ever? It's like, no. Is is Brian? Is Brian a star? If Brian's a star, then I've I've done my job. Well, problem solved. Um, <laughs> but I would say it's a very good point because the when you do a lot of things and you have skills in a lot of areas, you're you're you've got a great voice, Justin. You're very likable. Uh, you're a very good broadcaster. And so when you sit down to work on a thing that you did, you your focus is going to be worried about your performance. Yeah. And you're not going to be as objective about that as you would be about somebody else. And that is an advantage of being able to sort of shut down some of those skills, so to speak. Yes. Or to say like, oh, I can just dial back what I need from there. And I can give that person clear direction that I could give myself. And so I think that is, that's a, like, I'm very good at like, I, I won't, I can't read somebody's book and tell them what's good or not. Cause I really got horrible taste, but I can tell somebody if they tell me a plot, I can tell you, well, I can break down a plot and yeah. tell you like where your acts need to be and stuff like that. I think that's my strength, my own stuff. I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to be like, I don't know. I'm, I'll go through that indecisiveness, but I think I'm very good at like plot structure uh, and saying, in, in in the spirit of after things content, uh, Cliff Singer in the chat mentions that uh, uh, they supported the uh, Patreon early on and don't feel conned at all. Good quality storytelling worth it. <laughs> um, this was a genuine surprise, I think, to both of us. We we tried something that we've never tried before, which is after producing the first season, we made no specific promise whatsoever of any benefit outside of. If you liked this and you want more, become a patron. We will only promise you more episodes that come out faster of higher quality and you will never hear an ad. Yeah. Um, and then it was, it, it's on the one hand, it was terrifying for us month after month after month to send out one update. We're working on it <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and fully expect like the pitchforks to come out and all this stuff. And, um, and they never did. And it was really like that patronage made a fundamental difference in our ability to hire talent, yes. in our ability to uh, negotiate with confidence when it comes to the ad stuff and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it, 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 uh, we have had a playbook with Patreon since Patreon existed. And we violated all of our rules of Patreon uh, and, so, and, and learned a very powerful lesson about what, why some people do Patreon at all. Yeah. And, uh, and go ahead. Yeah. Well, like, I, I'm just I'm kind of double down to like, if tomorrow I said, uh, I'll, I'll give you a this is even better example, but I'll just say if tomorrow I said, Hey everybody, I have a great idea for a science fiction movie. I need to make this thing happen. I need to raise $10 million. It's going to be a painful experience. If Christopher Nolan said that tomorrow, a guy with a track record who's delivered stuff and given stuff to us without ever having to ask for it, but just being presented to us, I don't think he'd have a problem. And the way you did it though, like you put this thing out there first, here's the thing we did. We put in all of this effort. We
we went through all this effort when nobody was paying us. Yeah, right. You know, instead of the the problem, we get that contract. People like, well, if people pay me to do this, I'll do it. I'm yeah. like, how do I know you'll do it if you're not if you're you're not driven? You're purely told me there's a financial thing, which also tells me that if you do this, somebody else comes along to offer you more money for your. You're literally telling you there's a price for your time to change what you're doing right now. Yeah. And now all I know is if I start contributing this and now you get a regular job and you're going to apologize, like, oh, that's great, but this thing took off for me. Now I've got to do this. I hope you understand. It's been a great, it's like, oh, uh, you guys don't have that problem. It's, it's funny when you mentioned the $10 million figure, I thought you were teeing up uh, recently Brandon Sanderson. A fan Came to my head right as I said it. Amazing. Talk about that. Right. So, so Brandon Sanderson has uh, written several epic fantasy books. He took over the Wheel of Time series to, to bring it to a, a close. He, he's got, uh, you know, the Mistborn series. He's got um, uh, the, um, uh, the, I don't know, whatever I'm reading now. Uh, writes a lot, like proven track big, record. Big writer. Right. Uh, he basically said, I have four books. Um, I'd like to release them. Would you like to give me money? $10 million. Boom. Ten, biggest, biggest raise ever. Uh, it's, it's, it's truly remarkable. And, like, uh, uh, you know, he is releasing, like, here's an outline. Here's a, an element. Sorry, $33 million. Did On I Kickstarter. say 10? It, this is crowdfunding, <laughs> by the way. It, it, it wasn't. Did not Jesus. Was it. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't $10 million. It wasn't $10 million. Okay, Sorry. That's, let's not. $33 million. $33 million. <laughs> 30. On, like, On Kickstarter. Wait, is it done? Deal. Is it done now or is it still going? That's what this article says. Uh, well, uh, yeah. So, well, so, so he, um, uh, he already had the books written. He had a sterling reputation among his fan base as hard workers. Oh, sorry, 35. 35. Sorry, 35 million. And by the way, it's just weeks. entering into its most profitable phase of any Kickstarter, <laughs> the final 48 hours. That's amazing. So uh, it will it will be more than 35 by, by the time that that ends. And, you know. And I uh, believe Pebble... the books are already written. He wrote them during the pandemic. Love it. <laughs> Love it. And, you know, it's so funny to watch, you know, and, and Andrew, we've talked about this so much, but, you know, at the dawn of the Internet, people understood that art was going to change the way that the way that money came into art had to fundamentally change as the Internet was there. And all of, especially in, in fiction, all the different ways people tried uh, uh, Stephen King's like. Hey, pay me money, or I stop writing these emails the where the stories like keep uh, uh, coming. And then they stopped, and he got pissed, and he was like, "Not yeah, enough wait, money." Wait, wait, wait. Let me let me clear, let me clear, clear. Okay, Stephen King wrote the plant, and the goal was it would just be free. And the moment that more people were getting the free version and paying for it was he was going to stop. And you're like, okay. I, as a person paying for this, am now going to be punished because these other freeloaders came on board and heard about this? Yeah. It was the most perverse sort of thing in the world of like, it's that, and, and we talk about agency and theory of mind, and one of, one of these big problems you hear people solve, they, talk about, they talk about the they, yeah. they do this, they, who is they? And here it's like, like, Stephen, it's not like we all got together while you're out of the room, and I said to freeloaders, like, I paid, but you guys come on board and get it for free. <laughs> And then I got, I was in the middle of like three installments into the plant and it stopped because what did I do wrong? Nothing. Humanity. Humanity betrayed him. You see, yeah. that was the problem. Yeah. It was, sorry. I'm still bitter. I love Stephen King, <laughs> I but know. I'm still bitter about I paid for the three installments of the Evan plant and then he cut it off because other people wanted it for yeah. free. Well, you know, it's so out of character for him to have an anticlimactic ending. <laughs> to, 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 to alienate half of the people <laughs> in the middle. <laughs> So anyway, Brandon Sanderson, <laughs> yeah, uh, is a testament to what happens when you when you build uh, a lot of of trust with your audience, and um, uh, it's neat because like I, uh, uh, my daughter and I, uh, my daughter's the one that got me hooked on his stuff, and she's like, uh, "Do you want to know what it's about?" And I'm like, "I don't. I'm just happy he's making money, and I want to support that." And she's like, uh, "She's like, hey, just so you know." read the outline, I'm into what he's doing. And there's, from what I've heard, these books, uh, book three is going to be the one that's going to be your favorite. Like, she's really into the iterative yeah. process of everything. But, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, we stepped on your line earlier, Bryce. I, no, I, I, I'm so glad. I, that was one of the things I wanted to get into it. I'm actually going to try to block back his thing. Because, like, he is, he is consistently good 
He is a guy that knows how to write to his audience. He can write different styles. He does fantasy. He does sci-fi. He's, you know, he's our age. He's a reliable, consistent guy. And I, it is, when I saw what he did, it made me feel good about what the role of it means to be a writer in this world. It yeah. made me feel very good to know that if you are in there, I know people, writers who would go like, ah, oh, it's, it's like, Brandon is very, uh, Brandon, we're buddies now, very disciplined as a writer you know, and he understands me. his business and he, and he understands his audience. And, and I'm saying like, like if he can, if this guy at 45 or 46, or whatever can make, can do a $33 million Kickstarter for three books, 35, 30, somebody, and 35, counting, and counting, 440, 4, 35 million, 446,000 or 60,000. But anyway, <laughs> if he can do this, I would imagine that somebody who is talented and puts the work into talent, who puts together their own effort, might be able to make a living as a writer. Uh, can can I yeah. to to loop things back to World's Greatest Con? Um, knowing that this is going to be a very long term project, um, uh, at some point I said out loud uh, the words, uh, "I'm only interested in interested in starting things that are only going to get better as I get older." and World's Greatest Con is one of those projects, and and um, you know I'm sure it'll iterate and change or whatever. But man, do I look forward to five years, seven years, eight years from now when there's and there's a hardcore history history esque back catalog of stories that that we've collected. Um, uh, I can't wait to just keep providing value. And when the Liar um, Man debuts. <laughs> the liar man. Yeah, we ain't heard from liar Matthew. Liar <laughs> man. Where's hey Matthew? Where's Matthew? Where's Matthew McFadyen at? McFadyen. Or I don't know. Whatever. We'll figure it out. <laughs> Nobody, he, he was nobody, lying about we'll it. Figure it out. We don't know. We don't know. We left both pronunciations in the show because we don't legit know how his name is pronounced. It's pronounced too many ways on the internet. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, no. So that was that was a conceit of episode four, where. Uh, we realized that was an iterative. That was the hardest one to come together. But uh, in that episode, that episode is about the least well-known story of all of everything that we cover in season two, but it's a great story. It's a really fun story. And at a certain point we figured out, Oh, okay. It should be a movie pitch because this is the unproduced story. It's the unknown story. What if we're pitching this as a movie uh, only to realize that uh, Matthew McFady and from Tom from succession, uh, has been in a Netflix movie about mincemeat, which is our first season. He has been in an ITV AMC series about uh, the millionaire scandal, which was covered in season two. And so the next episode, right after the millionaire one, is Brian pitching like, hey, you've already done two of our episodes. <laughs> you got to complete the world's greatest con trilogy <laughs> and making it a, a personal direct movie pitch uh, was kind of what unlocked that, which, that which, episode, which, which I thought was fun. Which totally fixed the um, the biggest problem with that story was just it was a little bit thinner than some of the other stories. And uh, all of a sudden it gave us creative license to fill in the gaps with comedic beats and specific names and highly visual imagery and so on. Yeah. But it's a great simple I story. want to go back I want to go back to the Sanderson thing just for a second because I want to make a point here. Sure. Nobody look at the Kickstarter page. I'm like, I'm gonna ask you questions. Yeah. Thirty three million. How many backers okay. do you think there were? Oh shoot. Hard hard to see without knowing what the what, 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 what the tiers are, but I'm going to take a wild guess. God, I'm not good at math. Uh thirty uh, one hundred and fifty thousand pledgers. I'll say two hundred. Why did you do it, Bryce? He just gave me the answer. Is that right? Did he I guess? guessed. I'm guessing. Guess this it. is a game. Oh, hey! Wait, wow. How did he get the exact right answer? The perfect what? bid. Yeah. I'm the still new world's Canadian. greatest <laughs> con. <Do, do, do, laughs> The fix is in, everybody. Vanilla <laughs> producer. Oh, my God. You I'm... work with him for years. <laughs> <laughs> then one day, he ruins your show. One day, he was asking me how many backers there were, and I really did guess. So, but I did really he did. guess? That's amazing. That was an amazing. I, Bryce, I literally <laughs> thought you were looking at the I'm like, Bryce! I'm yelling at him, I'm like, why are you ruining this? I wanted to show how wrong they were. 
Oh that's my awesome. god! Well, but, but also that that speaks to how much people are pledging. Uh, before we even uh, we don't know how much it costs. Just looking at the page here, but that is what like three hundred dollars per person. A little less than that, two hundred, three hundred dollars per person. Yeah, well, I mean, the high tier stuff tends to throw that off a little bit. So I bet you the entry level thing is certainly beyond or below that. But uh, yeah, forty dollars is the lowest level that gets you anything. Wow, which yeah. is uh, relatively high. Usually, I mean, ten dollars to thirty dollars is no, but they're but but, 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 but multiple books. Yeah, multiple absolutely. books. Yeah, right. It's three three books or four books. Five, I think. Four, qu- uh, or quarterly four? books. Four uh, quarterly books. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so, so yeah, I mean, four four books for forty bucks. That's that's uh, wait, bargain what, basement. What a great microcosm what, of books? the actual Price is Right books. moment, it's where it's like 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 <laughs> Andrew instantly thought that the fix was in. <laughs> Shifty Bryce, but again, that's four ebooks. Look yeah. at the print to get the, the hard covers. Uh, let's see here. The premium hardcover is that right? Yes. Uh. A premium hardcover quarterly books a hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah, forty plus forty shipping. bucks a pop. Yeah, plus shipping. Plus so, shipping. Yeah, and that. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Let's see. So, what's very smart about this is he's extremely realistic. He is very realistic in what he offered. He also didn't decide I need to discount the ebooks on this, as he made yep. the ebooks the same as if you were going to pay on Amazon. And that's part of the genius was is he's like, I think my fans are okay paying the. Instead of, I'll charge the same price for Amazon, and my fans will probably appreciate the fact that they get to buy it from me. And what yeah. it's that, or worse, other than the opposite, the opposite of like, what if you could sell yourself? I could make it cheaper. Or you could just make it the same, and people might actually feel good that you're getting all of the money. Yeah. Instead right. of them looking at like, you should give me six bucks back, Mr. Sanderson. Like, oh, you get the extra six bucks? Then I feel better now. And, and like, look at this. So I'm looking at, uh, at the different pledge levels here. The number one uh re- reward tier is that $160 premium hardcover books 40,000 people have picked that uh um and then the next most popular one is uh is the ebook at 36,000 and then the audiobook at 33,000 but Ooh, on ebook and audiobook almost the same that's interesting uh and then on top of that there's an a $220 level that has all three of those uh about a little about nine thousand people have got that, so it's 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 like there are high, uh, high ticket uh, items here, and uh, oh wow, oh I completely missed this. Twenty thousand people uh, pledged five hundred dollars for all of those th- those three different versions of the book and swag boxes. So he's got like uh, I guess a merch element to it too. Um, but that smart is doing that at five hundred, right? Yeah. 500 you don't mind packing those merch boxes or paying somebody to pack yeah, those exactly. merch boxes uh, uh also i noticed that that we haven't gotten to the one he actually has to sit down and sign his name a million times yet uh i don't think he uh, didn't do a signature it might be an add-on god i there love are, him i there. love him even more <laughs> that he just didn't do any of the dumb sh- s word that normally <laughs> that normally happens with kickstart i i love it. i'm not signing anything i'm not signing i wouldn't sign my name if it was a contract that you gave me ten thousand dollars like like you are just gonna get books that's why you're here that's it you want to come to a reading i'll sign your book other than that sorry here's books baby yeah, every every chance it says hardcovers, it says in all caps, unsigned. On the- <laughs> love it. it oh, even better. Just- I'm buying the five hundred dollar one now. <laughs> I'm just, I am in love with Brandon Sanderson. Just get that money, King. You know it. You deserve it. Thirty five million and all. <clears throat> wow. Knowing the economics of Kickstarter, I would not be shocked if it gets over forty. In fact, I I I I, I would not be shocked if it gets you know uh, even. Closer oh, to 40 million. To, oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, because now is when there, you know, uh, there's all of the the uh, impetus to go and and do it before you miss out on it. And, and you won't be able to get it until later. He controls the entire release window. Just brilliant. And just brilliant. He, he, he's got yeah, the stuff is written. He's not promised to deliver until next year. It's, it is such a. I. Uh, I'm just oh because it's, it's going to be quarterly so he will do it quarter beginning 
next in year. Yeah. Oh, so all so the little smart. hiccups you have to worry about delivery, everything else like that. His fans know what they're actually. He's not gonna. Have, you know, oh. theory. He's not gonna have to. You want to know what else is brilliant about this? Is he's going to literally be able to spend every penny of the production and and uh, probably even the shipping and warehousing of this before the end of the year, which tax for tax purposes. Trust me, as somebody who has gotten caught on the other end of this, <laughs> the, the 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 tax implications of not having all of your business settled by the end of the year on Kickstarter money is very annoying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, oh, geez, Brandy, I. And, Go, you're the best. You're and, the best. It, uh, uh, you know, someone someone who has clearly has this amount of cash and good reputation went with Kickstarter. They didn't roll their own thing. They didn't go to Indiegogo. They didn't do a fig investment crowdfunding. Like it went on Kickstarter. It's still a brand. Know that, it's such a brand. Well, and and you know that's in spite of how much that they take in processing fees, how long it takes to turn that money around. I mean, uh, uh, it's not the most economical decision on paper. Um, and so it, uh, it, 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 it reads as acknowledging uh, exactly where, you know, the right platform at the right time. Without, without getting into things that I, I probably should not be talking about on a public forum, Kickstarter is extraordinarily valuable what you get from that, what you pay for when they do take more than Indiegogo and they take more than if you just ran a PayPal thing is the brand. Mm-hmm. There is such, I mean, and, why and is the, Patreon the valuable? The brand. You, you show up on the front page and in their emails and all that stuff. Yeah, that's beyond, the beyond, system, yeah. yeah but, but beyond even their promotion, which is great. It's great when you get it. Uh, it does make a, a big difference if you get that promotion. It is a place where people trust spending money it's where they probably already have their credit cards logged into their account because they bought you know uh, uh, cards against humanity or exploding kittens or any of the other gigantic ones that have all made uh, 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 a jillion dollars you benefit from them already having been in that ecosystem and you are just eliminating barriers for people to spend money on you uh i i think it is i have made business decisions based on our Ability or inability to be on that platform, I believe it is extraordinarily valuable. Hmm. I agree. I agree. And, and, and like I said, too, is that that ecosystem, it's so, I, all of my books are on Amazon. I get people like, why are you, why are you using exclusively Amazon? I'm like, it's Kind- Kindle Digital Unlimited, the KDU platform. It's a monster. It is, it is the, you know, the, the terms of the deal are, I'm only going to be there. But when it works in your favor, boy, does it work in your favor. And it's worked wonderfully for me. And with the, you know, Kickstarter, like, yeah, Sanderson doing this instead of some other platform. Smart. I, I root for other platforms succeed, but like that, that, that boost, like if you, if you come up with an iTunes, like an iPhone game, your goal is to have Apple select you. That's really the only yeah. way you're going to kind of get the attention you want is Apple selects you, you know, have the algorithm like you and the same with other systems and Kickstarter, you know, I've had, you know, my friends did their $4 million puzzle on Kickstarter and they got the love from Kickstarter because one, they work with, well, the creators of Cards Against Humanity and Exploding Kittens, yep. but also it was novel and different, and it was a different sort of pitch than what Kickstarter usually gets, and that's a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. Brandon Sanderson coming in, who is a huge writer who gets million-dollar paydays saying, I'm going to go use this platform. It benefits both, and uh, I just, like I said before, like the, the takeaway for writers and creatives out there is yeah, maybe there's not a 33 million, 35, whatever, 40 million. I'm going to call it 50 million right now. Let's go. Hey, 50, 50. 50. For everybody out there, but this was not a fluke. This was hard work writing. Yeah, oh, well, if you get to finish the wheel of – oh, yes, true. Everybody's going to have their own success story. But the hard work, the consistency as a writer and building up an audience, people had to like him. And if the average – the average, I just paid 300 books, and I've never finished one of his books. I've just paid 300 bucks. I've never finished one of his books, wow. but I love what he's doing. And I'm like, I just, I want to encourage that. And there's a lot of other people out there. I'd love to root for if they did something like that, mm-hmm. but they're not. Mm-hmm. Yep. Go off King. That's our review. Uh, <laughs> vinyl <laughs> copies of world's greatest God coming for a uh, hundred thousand dollars a pop. 
we can laugh. get that out of your mind. But, yeah, <laughs> I mean, but look at look at the music industry, right? Uh, oh no, no, no. With uh, vinyl, actually, it, cassette, it, it, yeah. even CDs, like they are they are losing their functionality and are becoming much more valuable as mementos and keepsakes. And I am you have to imagine that that is exactly what's going on here. When you're his part of his campaign is. I'm going to have four books, all of which you can get in physical copies, and I'm going to bake a bunch of boxes of stuff about the universe. I, I like, bet you a thing. Yeah, I bet you a thing that could sell right now. Like if you work, Brian, if you ever wanted to do your motivational book or something along those lines, um, if you got motivated to do it, um, you could do – see what I did there? Yes. I, if somebody – they used to have these. They fell out of fashion, but, like, they were, like, literally, like, those – they were, like, the portable MP3 players you could plug a headphone into. Oh, mm. like play buttons. If somebody sold, like, hey, I'll give you the I'll give you the digital copy player, but I'm also going to give you the credit card MP3 player and the headsets for 50 bucks extra, and they cost you $3 in Alibaba. That would be such a neat thing for things because we want to fetishize certain things. And and that's the thing I think about, like, oh, if, if there was a – like you look at what Kanye is doing with. His I was new, just gonna say, yeah, yeah, Kanye and the STEM player. Yep. So there's something neat about the idea of like I've created, a, you know, it's a simple device, but I'm a, this device rep, this thing represents the thing that like we're buying hard copies of books. It's like yeah, for three bucks, I'm like I'm gonna give you the audio book on this card with headphones plugged into it. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm 100% yeah. down. I actually really wanted to do uh, vinyl copies, but but the wait time because um, that long. industry is ramping up. It's like six to eight months. It's it's ridiculous. The, the problem the, and the problem with vinyl for you is that um, vinyl is great for selling to people who collect vinyl and have record players. To an audience, it's not used to buying vinyl. Correct. It's, it's, it's we're a cool also, thing to put on the wall. Yeah, we're also a hard thing format wise because even when we were thinking about doing it for the night attack albums which were at least you know albums uh uh it was just way too long we would have had to cut a bunch of stuff and like we would have had to you know cut parts of the show which it's like if you want if you're the completionist that wants to buy a vinyl thing then you know unfortunately that that format was was a hard fit for us but i still do think that there's there's stuff that we can there's stuff that we could do and and you know that's the beauty about brands like uh with world's greatest con if all of a sudden we wanted to do another thing or if we had finished another i mean this is what i love about this brandon sanderson thing and i i, I only <laughs> tangentially was aware of him before this but it's like if if we just took the time and just secretly did a thing and then said hey here's a here's a a, a, a 50 episode series that you're just gonna get it's already done give me money right now <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, well, I'll send you swag or or transcripts or uh, whatever, unsigned. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I am I'm I'm uploading something to a I mean, doc we, file and then I'm paying unsigned, somebody to hey be, make it happen. It's going to be unsigned by Brian Brushwood. It's going to be unsigned by Justin Robert Young. Unsigned. It's going to be unsigned by Bryce Castillo. You're going to now. I will it. not be unsigning it. I don't, have, I don't want my name oh, not associated with what this. A, what Bye. a god king, this man. I love it. I. We've said this before, but it's worth reiterating: is the already done. Yes, that those are the magic words. Already done, mm -hmm. already done, because people have been betrayed and misled. And I've had friends who I've supported that is on Kickstarters and Patreons that I never got the thing because they did it out of desperation, and then their problem resolved itself. Their need to they they didn't realize the price. They didn't realize that like great people just invested a bunch of capital in you, not just really the money for the thing, but trust in you. And now that you didn't finish the thing that your reputation's now kind of gone and they don't appreciate that. You yeah. know, it's like, Oh, mm -hmm. I got this thing. It's hard. I'm like, your justification works great. And people aren't necessarily going to write you angry letters, but it's going to be like, yeah, you're a flake. Yeah. All right. I, I, th I think we're over on time. So my pick is world's right. greatest con and Brandon Sanderson. My pick is, uh, Teller's Twitter account at Mr. Teller. Uh, my, uh, those are all my picks too. <laughs> my, my my pick is season three of World's Greatest Con. Yeah. Brandon Sanderson <laughs> <laughs> scheme for Kickstarter. <laughs> you sure you weren't supposed to it's unsign? It's, it, it turns out he's like uh, <laughs> the answer is Comic Con 1999. Yeah, <laughs> that was the world. That was the world's con. greatest guy. <laughs> There has got to be, he's got to have 
some success story. There's got to be something of Brandon being going from, again, Brandon, like, like he's going from con to con to Brandy. push his books and stuff and trying to get gas money or hoping you sell enough books at the table or I mean, that's the story I want to hear. 35. Like, you know, I was a millionaire at 15 Love because it. of my investments and I wrote for fun on a beach with supermodels. All right. Cool. <laughs> How do you really feel? What's your third act reveal? That's a supermodel on the beach. Oh. Gentlemen, it's been after. Hells yeah. She was Eastern European. <laughs> In my head. It's a more exotic locale. You got to, I got to start He's on the beaches of killers. Ibiza. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Ibiza. 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 Thank you, everybody, for tuning in for some weird things and after things. We'll be back in a few hours with Court Killers. That'll be fun. Uh, make sure you give everybody a follow at Andrew Main, at Shwood, at Justin R. Young. Yep. Yeah. Over at Marcus. All right, everybody. See you in a bit. See you, See you guys.